As the sun sets, the spotlights are on Sydney. The sweet sound of supercars. Drivers, stop your engines. Will rock the Harbor City. The sweet sound of supercars. Symphony. The big guns are back. Last year means nothing now. And there's our champion. Bathurst just made me want more. It all belongs to Jazz Master. To battle it out for the ultimate prize and for personal pride. Don't worry, there's always scores to settle. I don't get mad. I get even. A full field of challengers ready to rumble. It's my time. It's my time. It's my time. This is the Motorsport Blockbuster. This is an unbelievable game sometimes. The desire to win must be greater than the fear of losing. So this is game on. The Repco Supercars Championship starts now. Well, after a busy off-season away from the track, supercars were all back to life here at Sydney Motorsport Park, located just 40 kilometres from the centre of the bustling harbourside city of Sydney. The rain has been part of the story so far this weekend, but nothing can dampen the excitement of a brand new season. Jess Yates and Mark Beretta here on the grid. There's nothing quite like the incredible nervous energy and adrenaline that begins to bubble away here. All the drivers and teams getting back into the rhythm of racing, going through their processes and procedures, ticking off the list, making sure they've done absolutely everything to prepare for a new year. There are plenty of deep breaths, especially <laughs> for our pole sitter tonight, Barrett. Yeah, you bet uh, Anton Di Pasquale has got a big job ahead of him because Shane Van Gisbergen sits right next to him. 300 kilometres this race tonight. 77 laps of this 3.9 kilometre circuit. It is a tough one. An escape he described earlier. It is hard work out here. But there is that energy about tonight, isn't there? First race of the season. It's amongst the drivers. It's amongst the crews. It's amongst the team bosses. It's amongst the crowd. Everybody wants to get this going. There's a lot of pressure on tonight. First race of the year. Always the unknown. No one knows what's going to happen from here on and we can't wait to find out. Let's meet the drivers. Driver, the reigning Bathurst winner, Lee Holtzworth. And 2017 great race winner, David Reynolds. <laughs> Team 18 has a familiar lineup this season with the most experienced driver in the field. For Irwin Racing in the number 18, Bathurst winner and 2015 champion, it's Mark Winterbottom. And in new colours for Car 20, please welcome Scott Pye. Fielding four cars again this season, Brad Jones Racing is one of the longest running teams in the championship. Driving for SCT Logistics in the number four, it's Jack Smith. And in the Automotive Superstores 96, Macaulay Jones. <laughs> Rounding out the Aubrey lineup are two new faces to the team. Winner of his first supercars race last year and driving the R&J batteries number eight, it's Andre Heimgartner. Alongside in the Midi's Electrical 14, put your hands together for Bryce Fullwood. Erebus returns as Boost Mobile Racing with the same youthful driver lineup from 2021. After an impressive rookie season, back in the 99, it's Brody Kostecki. 
and winner from the last race here in Sydney, give it up for Will Brown. Walkinshaw Andretti United are fighting back to regain some of this historic team's illustrious past. Returning to the place he started his career, driving the Mobile One NTI number two, it's Nick Perkat. And put your hands together for your reigning Bathurst champion in the Mobile One Optus Racing 25, Chaz Mustard. Two fresh faces at Tickford this season, but both are hungry for success. For Trady Racing in the 56 Mustang, welcome Jake Kostecki. Alongside him, the Castro Racing 55 of Thomas Randall. From youth to experience, series champion in 2010, driving the number five Mustang, it's James Courtney. Alongside in the Monster Energy 6 and fresh from three wins last season, show your appreciation for Cam Waters. Shell V-Power Racing have been a force for several seasons in the championship and return with a familiar lineup this season. Two-time Bathurst winner in the famous number 17, Will Davison. And joining him, six-time race winner in 2021, Anton Di Pasquale. Red Bull Racing have a mix of youth and experience for season 2022. Winner of the Dunlop Super 2 Series last year and in his debut appearance as a main game supercar driver, please welcome Brock Feeney. Beside him, the dominant force from 2021. Bathurst winner, two-time and reigning supercars champion. Put your hands together for Shane Van Gisbergen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is your driver lineup for the 2022 Repco Supercars Championship. As they make their way to the front of the grid, please wish them well for the race ahead. the class of 2022 new drivers new teams two rookies in the field this year Shane Van Gisbergen and Brock Feeney take their seat amongst their peers Mark Scaife how are the rookies feeling at this moment they have a very high heart rate Jess this is a very big moment for both of them and Brock Feeney probably the most anticipated start to the year as a debut from Craig Lowndes in 1996 so Brock big shoes to fill replacing Jamie Winkup but he's done a great job to be in the top 10 and all the very best for him tonight. Great to see Lee Holdsworth back in the championship full time this year at Grove Racing after an incredible performance at the Bathurst 1000 last year. He's back full time. He is and I heard Chas Mostert say that he feels used and abused <laughs> based on doing such a good job at Bathurst and winning that race. He's left there but he's got a great opportunity to be able to step up in the main game and great to have him in the field, Jess. Absolutely, and for Chaz Mossin, he gets a new teammate this year in Nick Perkout, who'll start out a 14th on the grid tonight. How do you think he settled into his new home at Walkinshaw and Trinity United? I think he settled in really well. I remember he was there before and he knows the place very well. He was unlucky not to get into the top 10, so Mostert will be hard to beat also from eighth. Absolutely, they make a formidable team. We can't wait to see what they can do here tonight.
So we've got two new drivers at BJR in Andre Heimgartner and Bryce Forward. Andre Heimgartner doing a fantastic job to qualify at the pointy end of the grid tonight. What's it going to take for him to be on the podium at the end of race one? Good strategy because there's obviously some weather coming. Jess, we've spoken about that. We don't know when that does happen, but he's starting on the super soft tyre. There's only four of them and he's the leading guy in the top ten to put those tyres on early. So he should get a gain early in this race. He's obviously got to make sure that you don't get caught up in some of the first lap shenanigans. Let's get amongst the action on the grid. Rihanna. Nick Perkett, it's a really exciting time. The first race of the season, starting off P14 for a brand new team. <laughs> you make a funny face, but what, what is the sort of feeling like at the moment? Um, oh, obviously, everyone's very excited. Day one of school. Um, all the cars look amazing at the moment for the next you know, five, 10 minutes before we barrel through turn one. But you know, for me, a bit annoyed with myself. Um, just got the curb strike thingy at uh, turn five. So I think you know, the lap I had on the dash would have put us in the 10. But um, is what it is, off P14. So hopefully get a nice, clean start, pick off a few in the first few corners and then um, go on from there, really. Wish you all the best. Good luck. Thank you. Bryce Forward, I had you down to sneak into the 10 right at the end of qualifying. You were six one hundredths out, mate. Good job. Yeah, look, I'm really happy. I mean, um, it's been difficult. Obviously, we, we had a test day and uh, we're at Winton there where it's plus 35 degrees and, you know, the track temp, once it gets up in the middle of the day, it gets quite hard to learn. So we came here and obviously we were in the rain. We we're all over the place. So that was kind of my real first crack um, in anger with the car. And to be honest with you, I felt like we could have tuned it up better, but to be honest, to still come out 11th, I was actually really happy with that. And obviously super happy for Andre to be fourth. You know, I think that's a mega job. First race meeting in the car for him. So, yeah, awesome night ahead for us. Yeah, you'd have to be happy. Really solid start for you guys, both coming into a new team with Andre in, well inside the 10. You just out. 300 kilometres ahead of us tonight, though. You're on the soft tyre. Your teammate Andre's on the super soft tyre. So you've actually got a little bit of a chance to learn from your teammate here. Exactly right. I'm uh, not going to give the game away, although everyone at, everyone at home knows what's going on. But obviously we'll get a little bit of intel on them. But I think the big thing for us is more so how long is this rain going to hold out for? So, which is obviously the question that everybody's trying to play. And it's the reason why obviously everyone's on the same tyre, I think. So uh, it's going to be an awesome race, but uh, keen to get underway. Good luck tonight. No worries. Thank you. Scott Pye, new colours on the side of your car. Seiko, you've got a new engineer this weekend starting just outside the 10 for this one. What are the feelings for this race? Yeah, it was close. I mean, the field spread from fifth to where we are is really close, but it'd be interesting to see what happens in the race. There's not too many options with strategy, I don't think. So, And I think the rain has held off, which is great. But, uh, yeah, i just got to put my head down and, and do the best job that I can and um, see if I can get this thing up the, up the front by the end of the 300k. And working with Rich Holway, you sort of worked with him a little bit before, but working directly with him now, how's it going this weekend? Yeah, awesome. Loving the opportunity. I mean, he's, uh, he's credentialed speak for themselves and it's awesome to have someone like that I was lucky enough with Phil last year we got two guys where you can just totally back them and uh, you know I think for them to trust their instinct is always the best way and uh, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get up there this weekend but I'm looking forward to the remainder of the year good luck thanks cheers Scott Pye doing a terrific job starting out of 12th on the grid. Mark Winterbottom, his teammate, right behind him in 13th. Now, we know that the weather is going to play a part in the story tonight. Currently, the situation is, and I'm standing here on the grid and I can actually feel a few spits of rain, but the Bureau is saying 7 o'clock we can expect light showers, 8 o'clock moderate showers, 9 o'clock thunderstorms. Now, whether or not any of those showers are going to be on time, we'll have to wait and see. But absolutely. Absolutely, the rain will play a story here tonight at Sydney Motorsport Park. What a way to kickstart the 2022 season. We're counting down to race start here at Sydney Motorsport Park for the very first race of the Repco Supercars Championship and the entire Supercars fraternity wishes to extend its deepest condolences following the passing of the late great cricket legend Shane Warne who has tragically passed away. Our thoughts are very much with the Warne family and Shane's friends and colleagues. A legend taken way too soon. Nineteen years of age, Brock Feeney steps into Jamie Wincup's car in the main game. Jet, I'm excited for you, Brock. 
Um, how do you feel at the moment? How's the nerves? Yeah, obviously, it's pretty, probably one of my biggest races so far, but I'm excited. You know, we've got a long race ahead of us tonight. I'm racing against guys that I've been watching on TV for many years, so it's a pretty exciting time for myself. Jamie, give you any advice? Does he say anything? Any tips? Uh, yeah, he's certainly there. Um, I've got a great team around me. You know, Shane is my teammate. has been awesome. Obviously, he's on the front row. Um, so plenty of things to learn off of myself, and, yeah, we'll see what the race brings for us. Brock, you've got a great little battle group here. Enjoy it. Good luck tonight. All the best. Thanks very much. Cheers. Chaz Mostert, there's lots of smiles. There's lots of sort of camaraderie here on the grid, but now it gets serious. You're starting eighth position on the grid. You weren't quite happy with that in the top ten shootout. What can we expect for this race? Uh, I'm not too sure. We've just got to keep working on ourselves around here a little bit. We just... Uh, struggle getting the perfect balance of the car so um, whatever that reason is for here compared to, to other places we go to um, we just got to keep working hard and so I know, I know the guys are up to the task but um, yeah I'd love to be a few few rows further forward for the opening race of the year. Good luck Chaz. Thank you. Cameron Waters doing a lot, bit of last minute prep here getting the boots ready after walking through the mud. We're starting out at grid 22 Cam I'm not going to ask you why I want to know what your plan is for the 300k ahead. Uh, just attack, so um, we've got nothing to lose. We're pretty far back. Car was pretty ordinary in qualifying, but you know we've thrown a shitload at it, and we'll see what uh, what happens. Obviously, the rains are coming, so um, hopefully it rains and I can drive a Ford. Good luck tonight. Thanks. Well, it wouldn't be a new supercar season without a little bit of drama at the uh, Penrite Racing team. There's a familiar face in the garage, David Couchy, former Red Bull Racing engineer, Shane Van Gisbergen's engineer last year. We didn't actually expect to see him at the circuit this weekend. Part of the conditions leaving Triple Eight is they place uh, leaving staff under gardening leave. So it was a bit of a surprise. It's now in the hands of all the legal action. So that's going to be interesting to watch. He was just behind me and he was actually talking to some of the Red Bull staff. So it's still friendly games down here on the grid. Absolute pleasure to be back inside the Hino Hub for 2022. Let's have a look at the detail for our exciting first instalment of our brand new championship series. The Borough Pairs Sydney Super Sprint, 300 kilometres of racing tonight, 77 laps. Welcome back to work, all 25 drivers. It's going to be a big night of action. Pit stop overview. There are two compulsory stops in the rules, but chances are we're likely to see more tonight. Things to keep in the back of your mind. The fuel capacity of a supercar is just a little over 110 litres. The rules require that you must drop into the car during the race 140, so clearly it doesn't fit. That requires at least two stops. I'm tipping we're likely to see more. As you transit down the pit lane, it's about 37 seconds. You've got to stick your fuel and tyres in after that. And your fuel burns vary and your range and your critical lap all vary dramatically depending on whether or not it rains. And that's the big question. I've been up and down the lane, in and out of the garages, talking to people in their transporters, and there is a massive amount of divergent strategies being talked about at the moment. Frankly, there's a lot of confusion. This one is a really tricky race to be able to unpack and understand. Now, one thing we need to keep in mind, it is exactly 90 days since engines switched off at Mount Panorama. The Christmas pudding effect for commentators, for drivers, for team managers, for mechanics, for everybody in the show, they've got to get back into to their game face, their race faces have got to be on. This is 13 laps longer or 50 k's longer than any of the races that we did here last year and it is hot and sweaty. I mean it's like Darwin here in the tropical season at the moment. It feels like about 25 or 6 but the temperature feels beyond 30 when you walk around outside. So new driver team combinations, there are 10 of those. Massive percentage of the field has varied year on year as they all try and claw back to the position that Shane Van Gisbergen achieved last year but this is one of a couple of really big wild cards tonight. Dunlop have prepared a brand new super soft tyre. They've never tested it. Nobody's got any intel on it. They all use a thing called a durometer to try and poke it and see whether or not it's softer. It is softer, but how long does it last? We think, I think, it's probably going to be a tyre that'll give you somewhere between 15 to up to 20 laps. But the big question mark, weather. So do you run the super soft at the start? Do you run it in the middle? Do you run it at the end? We saw Triple Eight back to back their tyre last year and get two runs out of it and it was really good. And do you end up running the wet? Now, I want to show you something if I can light my phone up in time and I'm going to run out of time here, I know, because time is not our friend, but this is the giant wild card. Sitting on the Blue Mountains at the moment, there is a lot of weather, but the flow at this racetrack is from the east, so it's parked up there. Will it get here? Nobody knows. It's going to be fun. So, Neil, well said, mate. I really can't add much more to that other than we're at Sydney Motorsport Track. This is a tough, tough track. Why? 
84% of the time that you're driving around this circuit, you're turning the steering wheel. So that means that's enormously difficult on drivers and on tyres. And we just don't know what's going to happen to that blue soft tyre. So think about it. The rain, I can see it. It's coming from the west. There's nothing surer. There's going to be 50 or 60 pit stops in this race and maybe more if it's wet. There's no way they're all going to go to plan. So sit down, grab a beer, coffee and enjoy the ride. Ride. Welcome to 2022. Loco, time to get things officially started now. It is time for the Welcome to Country. Please welcome Taylor Clark. My name is Taylor Clark and I'm a proud Darug and Gunungurra woman. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Darug people, and pay my respects to my ancestors and elders who walk this sacred land beside me. Tiari Mara, Daragapemo. Warami Midaga Gurumbarak Didrigo. These are Dara Glands. Hello, friends. It is good to see you. Thank you so much, Taylor. Great to have such a big crowd here with us tonight at Sydney Motorsport Park as we get set for the very first race of the season. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome for our national anthem, Siobhan Clifford. Australians, all that us rejoice for. soil and wealth for toil a home is girt by sea a land abounds in nature's gifts of beauty rich and rare in history's page let every stage advance or strail your fare in joyful strains then let us sing advance australia fair beautifully done let's take a look at the pizza hut track map because this is one of the best race tracks in the country big fast and flowing 3.9 kilometers just under a hundred miles an hour average speed 159 in fact and have a look at the layout 11 turns and it all starts with this big run into turn one super fast and it's an action area by yourself let alone when you apply 25 cars to it around the back of the track turn five and six there's always chaos there's elevation change there's curbs there's lots of different surfaces and it's a place that we absolutely love and didn't it turn it on at the end of last year? We understand so much about this layout. We've raced here a lot in the recent past, but tonight, 77 laps. We know that the weather is coming. And what about the start? Anton Di Pasquale plays Shane Van Giersbergen off the front row, alongside Tim Slade with a great job. Best job ever at Sydney Motorsport Park for him. Andre Heimgartner, his best shootout. Will Brown for Erebus, beautiful job also. Will Davison, little mistake down there at turn eight, and that cost him. Brody Kostecki lines up alongside Chas Mostert, the current Bathurst champion. Brock Feeney lines up alongside David Reynolds, and it's going to be a wild first lap for young Brock, who's only 19 years of age. Bryce Forward and Scott Pye in 11 and 12. Bryce Forward now with Brad Jones Racing. Mark Winterbottom alongside Nick Perkett. Couple of hardheads, couple of very experienced operators. James Courtney, the same could be said for him. Local Penrith boy originally lines up alongside Jack LeBrock. He's the fastest of the Tickford cars. That's a mystery. Todd Hazelwood alongside Jack Smith. Very good job, Jack Smith. And Thomas Randall, new to the series this year. A great addition for Tickford lines up alongside Gary Jacobson. Macaulay Jones in 21st. Cam Waters way down the pack. We just heard from him a second ago. He's going to do everything to move forward. And Lee Holdsworth, the current Bathurst champion in the series full time, lines up on the, on the second last row just in front of Jake Kostecki. So it's going to be a river. I said at the start that the Van Gisberg and Anton Di Pasquale battle, it had plenty of history. There were times last year where they ran into each other on the run to turn one. We're looking at the weather. We just heard from Neil Crompton in the Hino Hub. It's 25 degrees. 
it's very, very humid. It's going to be very physical tonight. 300 kilometres around here is going to be super, super tough. Crompo, it's hot out there. Man, it is so sticky out there. I would not want to be in the cockpit of the car. There's Will Davison. He was not happy with himself in the Armour All Top 10 shootout. We're starting a great big season, Will. What are your thoughts? Hey, hey boys. Yeah, here we go. 2022. I'm uh, yeah, forgotten about the shootout now, and we've got a long old race ahead of us to uh, try and make it right. So, um, yeah, let's see what the weather's got. It's certainly coming in. So, uh, yeah, we're well, uh, looking forward to this battle. Thanks, Will. All the best for tonight. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Will Davis in car number 17. Been a winner at this racetrack. Shelby Power Racing Team. And he's driving forward. Dick Johnson racing. He will start out of position number six after a little bit of frustration. His first sector in that top ten shootout was terrific, but he made a little mistake in the braking area into the hairpin at turn eight. So, Mark, the point that I wanted to expand on a little more from inside the Hino Hub, the wind all week here in Sydney has been from the southeast, but the weather in the upper levels is coming from the west. It's currently parked at the top of the Blue Mountains, which is essentially off the end of turn one, Yep, <laughs> all the way to the west, a fair way off. But how quick is it transiting? So when you go up and down in the pit garages at the moment, in the transporters, they're all vigorously debating. Hits, uh, let's check out the Century Batteries race snapshot for you so currently 25 really sweaty out there feels like 30 degrees cloudy with the possibility of rain 77 laps 300 kilometers and a couple of compulsory stops but this is an ice cream headache race from a strategy standpoint because nobody knows what the soft tire is going to do from dunlop and nobody knows what the weather's going to do so if you've got to drop 140 liters into the car and you know that the math tells you at 3.1 liters a lap you need therefore roughly 240 liters You've got to start with 100 litres. But what happens if it rains? Yeah. You've got to get your fuel in somehow. That's right. And nobody with any real authority can tell us up and down the pit lane what's going to happen with the tyre. What it all means when you're sitting at home? Entertainment. <laughs> it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. And at the end, somebody's going to get it right. There'll be a little bit of a luck factor in some of this as well. So storylines everywhere at the moment. 13 new driver engineer combinations. 10 new driver team combinations. 25 cars, established stars and newcomers about to make their mark. And this venue last year delivered some great moments where people were able to achieve lifelong goals of armor all pole positions and race victories. Ludo Lacroix preparing his man to bring his car into pole position. And Di Pasquale has been remarkable at this racetrack in the recent past. He is going to start from the armor all pole alongside Van Gisbergen. You will hear that phrase frequently in 22. Tim Slade, Andre Heimgarten, a brilliant performance to be on the second row of the grid. In behind them, Will Brown and Will Davison. We spoke to Will Brown, this is the Master. We've got it all cleared to get our season underway. The class of 22 open their championship accounts. And in fine style, the front row of the grid blasts into action. Di Pasquale's done a beautiful job. Van Gisbergen sweeps around the outside. And already those two have bolted from the pack on the run to turn two. Will Brown was a sensational start. He was able to get by the complete row in front. He fires down the inside and he's just given Van Gisbergen a hit. So Will Davison pulls him behind there. Will Brown was the best start of everybody in that lead pack. Lights starting to take effect. Turn three, cold tyres, cold brakes, cold mines. But they are back into hardcore, vigorous racing. And already we've got Marista Tails of Mud with those in the dirt on the outside over the crest of the hill at three. And splashing wide there was David Reynolds. Bryce forward up on the outside in the Mini's electrical racing entry. And look at how far and wide many of them are transiting across the line at turn five. They can get away with that in the early phase of the race, but not later on. Gee, there's been some wild stuff in the mid-pack. James Courtney was up five spots the last time I looked. But that start with Heimgartner and Slade, they missed the kick completely. So the front row got away really well, and then effectively the third row took their spot. A little bit of the pressure's now come off Di Pasquale, so he's got a half-second margin, but it is wild back in the pack at the moment, as it always is, as they battle for supremacy. Very important to open your account strongly, to get points in the bank, to have a straight car and maximise while you can. The weather is a giant threat here at the moment, and it's all sitting on the hills at the end of Turn 1 down there. 
Deepa Spiley is our leader at the end of the standing lap from Shane Van Gisbergen, Will Brown, Will Davison, Andre Heingartner, Brody Kostecki's just moved up one spot over Slade, then Mostert, Fullwood and David Reynolds in our top ten. So Slade was the biggest loser. He lost four positions and the biggest winner, James Courtney, up four. So was Cam Waters up four spots. Now Shane said after the shootout that's the best car he's had here and he made a quantum leap of performance from qualifying, uh, beg your pardon, from practice into qualifying and then the shootout. That car was very, very good. But it's still not quite quick enough early on in this race at the moment to be able to tackle Di Pasquale. Now, the first thing to remember here is that the brave runners that have chosen the super soft tyre, there's only a handful of them, but the first in the queue is Heingartner. It's four of them. Yeah, so Heingartner's sitting in fifth position at the moment. The reason I've flagged him is he's just gone quicker in sector one than anybody else. And he's done a pretty good job from a poor start. So remember, he went backwards, but he's back to fifth. Yeah, well, that was handy for Randall to get around there. Mark Woodbottom was very nice to him. And look at that. Who capitalises? Two spots. That will be for Cam Waters. Three wide on the exit of turn eight. Cam Waters, Thomas Randall, Jack Smith mixed in there together with Mark Winterbottom. And it gets tricky when you get to this part of the racetrack in nine and ten because it becomes single lane. They tidy it up. Line of stern through there. Meantime, Heimgarten has now got those tyres kicking into action. Faster in the mid-sector than anybody else, and you can see him in the R&J batteries entry. He's starting to sniff around the back of Will Brown on the run into turn one. He'll have a lunge when he gets down there to turn two. There's our leader. Here's the battle for second and third. And in fact, it's actually Will Davison under pressure at the moment, not Will Brown, and there goes Heimgarten. So he did make that move at two. And Will Brown, who gave Van Gisbergen a bump earlier going into turn two, is putting a huge amount of pressure on Van Gisbergen. He's got real pace. Now, every strategist and engineer in the paddock will be watching Heimgartner very carefully because this also pulls the mask off the Lone Ranger when it comes to understanding what the super soft tyre is capable of doing around here and how much different is it compared to the 21 tyre. James Courtney, new colours, new livery this year. Officer Lock backing for him at Tickford. Now down the inside for another spot, as you'd expect. Heimgartner makes a clean move. He's making those tyres work well. That gets him up into third spot, in behind Van Gisbergen, and he's only 1.8 seconds from the lead. Yeah, these are working well. I'm surprised only four put those tyres on. I thought more would do that, given the weather coming. Well, it's such a variable and such an unknown X. Replay of the start. Watch these two at the front. Beautiful starts from both of them. And really, it was the fact that Anton had the inside line that really gave him the ideal run into turn one and have a go. They've already got three or four car lengths over row two. On board with Will Brown. Nice job. Not much in the way. A wheel spin converted nicely. Grabs third gear on the run into turn one. This is Will Davison's car looking down the flanks of the Mustang. Little bit of wheel spin for Will but it was still enough for him to clear Heimgartner. And there's Tim Slade, who did get his ears boxed a little bit on the opening lap. He certainly did. In fact, it was a bit weird for Heimgartner to not get the sort of start you'd expect from that super soft tyre. Thought that he might get a yield just even off the line. So at the moment, when you look through the field, Cam Waters is up six spots and Slade down six spots. How's the replay of them at four, though? The number of people that actually splashed wide into the mud. And if you go out there, it is garbage. It's so wet, drags all the rubbish back onto the racetrack. All right, so this has only just happened. We're picking up on this replay, and Tim Slade under assault here by Chaz Mostert. And Chaz pretty easily able to go down the inside. Remember the huge investment made by New South Wales State Government and Australian Racing Drivers Club in the lighting out here, so these cars will come to life and look fabulous. Now, Heingart has moved up one, small, uh, one more spot, so he's now grabbed... Shane Van Gisbergen, and there's a bit of a queue forming there at the moment, isn't there? There's actually quite a bunch of cars. So Andre sets off after Anton. 1.6 seconds is the margin, but that car's got pace. But he's got a balancing act, because if he tries to extract all of the performance out of those tyres early on, he'll hurt them. He needs to be able to run them as far as he can run them so that they don't end up in a fuel strategy boggle. Yeah, no doubt. It's a really good point now because you've got to not energise them too much too early. Well, they've got to make space in the fuel tank to be able to bring on the first portion of the 140 litres. And if you use known averages of around about 3.1 litres per lap, the, t the, the teams work in kilos. We make it simpler for everyone at home by dealing in litres. 
but you're going to have to get at least 22 odd laps further down the road before you can start to think about putting any fuel in. And will a super soft tyre last that long? We don't know. There's an asterisk because there always is. You know the bottom of the form? It's in font you can never read. The asterisk is you might you might be cheeky at the very beginning and actually run the fuel a bit lower to start with, but then you're going to have to be in a position to be very careful with what happens further down the order. Bocchini out wide at turn five. And Van Gisbergen just said his car's weak in the front at the moment. And then talking about anti-roll bar changes, so that means that Shane's looking to get the front of the car to respond better. And it's been a pretty lively first three or four laps for Brock Feeney. He's down four positions, and that was Percat that was able to put that move on him. So he softened the front anti roll bar, Shane Van Gisbergen, just to get some more turn in the front oh! of the car. Who was that that had the big moment? Brock. Crossed up. Brock. Was it? Yeah. He was, he was sideways to the right, then had to try to get it to turn left. Have a look at the bomb, a radar screen, and that red does not look good. No. No, but that, it's not uncommon for it to sit up there like that. And then the challenge at the moment, as I said, in the Hino Hub, is that if you go outside and you look at the flags on the top of the pit building, the low-level wind at the moment, the ground-level winds, are actually from the east and southeast. So it might have the effect of parking that weather on the top of the hill. The upper level is from the west, but it's just another complication in a very tricky story, and there's the evidence. Yep. So that is a southeasterly. But the weather that you just saw on the Bureau's radar that's sitting up on the hills, that's being driven typically by, in the mid to higher levels, by a westerly flow. And when you did a survey, because I reckon I went into most garages, most were saying about mid-race they thought the wet was coming. That was their, that was their tip. Well, and for me, when in the, I, there were engineers around me and they were measuring the movement of that storm and then trying to convert it to math and then saying, OK, if it's got that velocity, it's going to get here at that, that time. And I went, that's great. If you looked outside at the easterly breeze, they went, oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so I kind of ruined that party. So trying to guess the weather is like trying to guess the lotto numbers. So you need to be very lucky to sometimes get that right. And uh, someone will typically use 2020 hindsight to say, I was a genius, and there's others that will fail badly. But it makes it really interesting for us. We're riding with David Reynolds. He's sitting comfortably in the 10. Position six, looking at the brake lights of Will Davison. Bunnings Trade Speed Trap shows you the pace through that corner. It's fantastic. It's a gorgeous corner. It really tests your bravery and your car balance. So both driver and car challenged. How's that little touch-up? So Will Davison says hello and welcome to Will Brown on the exit of Turn 2 at the second apex. It hurt him. It hurt him. Because David's grabbed him, I think, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. So that little touch-up that he gave Will Brown in the middle of Turn 2 heard his exit and David Reynolds was able to sneak around the outside there remembering that David Reynolds is on the super soft tyre also so Heimgartner in second Reynolds in fifth are the two lead cars that are on the super soft tyre Thomas Randall further down the order and Chris Pither currently running 25th are also on there there's David Couchy new team principal at Grove Racing Penrite cars so Thomas Randall's the driver that's been warned for exceeding the track limits and that can happen in two spots around here one of them is turn five the other is this hairpin on the exit of turn eight a bit of congestion here and Boston's making progress he's got Brody around him at the moment and Tim Slade tucked in behind and you can see from the mist in and around the cars you don't have to venture too far off the racing line to drag water on second. He's right on him. So Tony's just told Andre, it's the second car on screen here, use the tyres if you have to to clear him and then give him a breather. So he's sniffing at it. And what you don't need to do is be hung there behind that car for very long because as they ingest the hot temperatures of the car in front, it will knock those front tyres around especially. So what you'll find is that Andrea will have to pounce, he'll have to find a spot. If he can get a run out of five out of here, he might plunge down the inside into six. All right. He looks pretty strong here. 
but that gap sometimes tends to diminish. He's no, he's it. got it done. You were on it. So it clears him and puts him in the lead, Andre Heimgartner. So nice way to open his 22 account with Brad Jones Racing and the R&J Batteries Holden Commodore. So our new leader is Andre Heimgartner. He's got a tyre advantage at the moment. Now, the next part of that story is he's got to look after them if he's going to be able to convert that into something later. Trouble and smoke from the back of car number 20. So Scott Pye and the Seiko 5 racing entry heaving smoke out of that car. So is that a power steering issue or worse? We've seen people tripping over curbs around here and having troubles. Steering, that was Richard Holway. We've still got assistance. No, no, assistance, no, assistance. That's no assistance, so it's power steering. So that'll be horrible to steer. These cars have got a huge amount of negative camber and a lot of caster on them. Makes the steering weight mega heavy, so yeah, the steering's failed. And blue. further up in the queue and coming into the pit lane, one of the truck assist entries, I believe it's Jack LeBrock. It is car number 34. So big efforts gone into launching the Matstone Racing entry in 2022. Truck Assist backing both the cars. Jack LeBrock and Todd Hazelwood, they were quick on Friday in practice. They they were quick, weren't they? In fact, yeah. I reckon I said to you that I thought they'd bad work around at Matstone Racing. This is sad because uh, the hope was that Scott Pye had a good positive start to the championship season and uh, that looks pretty evil underneath it, doesn't it? Something's melting big time. And uh, Charlie Schwerkold only put that deal together with Seiko just in this past week. The car went to Winton for the test day and it was plain black. So uh, very frustrating for these guys. It's a huge personal and financial commitment made by Charlie Schwerkold in this team. And uh, there's a lot of his own DNA in trying to make this work. So this is not what they want. And that's a completely signed line. That car now is going to be there for quite some time. So here's the first evidence of this. Oh, was that, the, was that a bumping duel then with Courtney? Yes, They've so. had a bit of history, haven't they? Yeah, they have. It may be the case that he ended up cooking, uh, hooking it over the top of the kerb. And this is where we picked up the shot and made the first remark. So Brock Feeney in the foreground in car number 88. Cheer. So that means 24 cars active on the racetrack. We've been racing for 14 minutes and there's already plenty to contemplate. Heimgarten has skipped away in the lead now. He's got a one and a half second margin. And there's a few people that are copying the wrath of the headmaster at the moment. Reynolds, Macaulay Jones, and Jake Kostecki have all been told, go easy, bad sportsmanship flag for exceeding track limits. Nice job by Heimgarten not to use those tyres too hard as he's got to P1. He's got a 1.2 second lead, but he hasn't gone mad with it, Crompo. He's only really about four or five tenths of a second faster than Deep Pasquale. So that's a nice job. You've got to be contained, you've got to be smart, you've got to be clever with this, and not use them too hard. He's done a very experienced job in this early phase. Event number one, the Repco Supercars Championship, Sydney Motorsport Park, our Borough Pairs, Sydney Super Night. We're opening our account for our new season. Racing under lights in Western Sydney. We're about 40 kilometres to the west of the CBD, and we've been racing now for 15 odd minutes, and that was an awkward moment for Macaulay Jones, skipping wide at turn six. And you pause and hold your breath a little when they go onto the green stuff at the moment because there is no grip, no traction, no control out there most of the time because it's so heavily wet off the racetrack. And a bit of assistance there from Lee Holdsworth. So McCauley comes across, he's trying to run Lee out. So Lee just a little bit of contact there. There'll, there'll be a bit of dispute around who was to blame for that one because Macca was escorting him wide, but he had to turn back at some stage. And that's all the lock on. What you said is exactly right. I thought it might have gone in the fence on the right hand side based on all that action. Yeah, that was uh, a near miss. So Chris Piffer, car number 22, Coke entry for Premier Hire and Coca-Cola. Pete Gibberis is the owner of that team. And he's a new entry into the supercar family in 2022. So Chris, who's well accustomed to knowing what goes on at Brad Jones Racing because he's worked with them on plenty of occasions most recently in the endurance race at Mount Panorama, and he's tucked in behind one of their cars right now. So he and Macca are getting stuck into it. Paulie Jones, footwell cam. 
So this gives you an idea of the foot skill of motor racing in this process as well. And uh, these little tootsies of his will be dancing at the moment because that car looks pretty lively out there at the moment. It's sliding a lot and you've got to be so careful. It's one thing to do a quick lap round here for 3.9 kilometres. It's another thing to do a stint with a big load of fuel, with 80 or 90 kilos of fuel in the car, and you've got to look after the tyres. You've got to change that rhythm. So when you see what he's doing with his feet at the moment, that tells us we are in race mode. Let's get to Rihanna. Scott Pyre, an incredibly frustrating way to start your season. Obviously a power steering issue. Just talk, us, talk to us about what happened. Yeah, just, uh, I don't know. I, I, honestly, I don't know. It's just, just anger at the moment because it's just frustrating. You know, we obviously Bathurst had this drama. And then, um, yeah, we've been cruising now. had really good car speed. And then JC blown his tyres off, so he's coming back towards us, went down the inside. And just the cabin, you blew a hose off the power steering. And um, now I couldn't get off him. I couldn't steer off him, and I was locked on him. So... Yeah, I feel for everyone. They're working so hard, and these these mechanical dramas. We threw away a top ten the championship last year, and then to lose so many points when you're running, well, we would have been in the ten that race. The car was good, so I just feel for everyone. But it's not through a lack of trying. Everyone's working their backsides off, and we're just not getting what we're what we're you know working for. A real sense of urgency once you got into the garage to get out of the car. There was there's definitely flames, and the fumes yeah. are quite intense. Are you okay from that sense? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, well, you're feeling it too. That when they let those bombs off and get the fire extinguisher going, but um. Yeah, obviously, the, once the, the uh, fluid, once you stop and there's no air to keep the fire out, obviously, it just engulfs the car. So I thought, it, I didn't realise it was fire, obviously, they start screaming to get out. You can get out pretty quick when you need to. And uh, I've been on fire before, not not personally, but uh, at Winton, when my car caught on fire, you get out pretty fast. But luckily, everything's OK. We'll be back tomorrow and hopefully no mechanicals. Bad luck. Thanks, Thanks. Ross. Thanks. Just a quick update on Jack LeBrock and the truck assist number 34 Commodore. He actually snuck into pit lane at the exact same time Scott Pye was making his way back to the garage. He came in, took tyres and fuel, the first of the three stoppers. So that car running on a very alternate strategy. Yeah, and if you can get it right and the weather doesn't interfere, the three-stop thing could work. I didn't introduce that into the Hino Hub discussion because I'd still be there trying to unpack all the detail around it. <laughs> Nobody would like that. So... It's a really complicated race in that sense, so good pick up there. And you never know, Garth, because the way this thing could play, with the unknown X around the tyres and the weather, and the complications of having to get the fuel in, you could pull a rabbit out of a hat here with strategy and end up with somebody that you don't necessarily expect to do well. Larka? Yeah, Neil, strategy-wise, you know, let's just chat about that for a minute. I'm trying to keep an eye on the tyres here up here at the Shell team and at Red Bull Racing. They've both got the blue tyres out. Shell have, in fact, just dragged them to the front of the garage. I look at the weather. It's coming, mate. I don't think you've got to be a genius. But what's interesting, Scafie's right, some out there have got a game, but they're telegraphing that information, aren't they? The band of rain, if it does come, is very narrow. Think about it. A drying track and those super soft tyres on a drying track at the back end of this race, that's a winner. Yeah, so do you run them at the start? Do you run them in the middle? Do you run them at the end? And how good are you at predictions? That's really what it's all about. Yeah. So, yeah, we know it's coming. But the big question there, Larko, that you skipped nicely over is when? Yeah. Is it in the next 10 minutes, the next hour, or sometime in the middle of next week? Oh, well, and also, it would be lovely to put the super soft tyre on at the end, but it will have to be dry or semi-dry because there's just no way that they work around a surface like this. It's so low grip, a wet tyre will be 10 or 15 seconds a lap faster if it's damp enough for genuine wet tyre usage versus a super soft slick. So the Dunlop tyre variants this weekend, again, is a great initiative. We've got the soft tyre that they make, we've got the super soft tyre, you must put it on. No one's been able to use them yet in practice. We don't know what they're going to do. So the real jeopardy in this thing is, how long does the tyre live? Can you make it do effectively a fuel stint? Is a three-stop strategy going to give you the yield you'd like under normal conditions? And will the weather play a part? There's so many queries out there at the moment. It's a crystal ball fest. David Reynolds is lurking in fourth position, also on a super soft tyre. Just a watching brief. But the other thing is, if you conserve them too much and you don't actually get a gain from them, in net terms, if it is a dry race, you'll give away the advantage that your competitor gets from the super soft later in the timeline, if you follow. Yeah. Because yeah. if they're sprinting at the back end of the race and you're conserving at the front on your version of that grip, that's a gap. So that's the other problem when you're the pioneer in the process. So of the front runners, both Heingartner and Reynolds are out there feeling their way with this at the moment. Like, what is it going to do? What's my pace? How's this going? What do they feel like? How hard can I push them? There are only two people in this entire precinct that know the answer to that question. 
and they're out there and I can't ask them at the moment. <laughs> Neither can anybody else. But you do get an indication from the lap splits. So if you look at Heimgartner's lap relative to Deepa Squally at the moment, basically the same in sector one. He's a couple of tenths quicker in the mid sector. So they're not really making much of a gain out of it. Now that, look, I think it is clear that there is going to be some weather at the back end, but in net terms, you'll lose that battle to anybody that can, let's say you stick those swap things on at the last 15 laps of the race and go to berserk. That's a game. Yeah. Or you can do it then in a more robust way. Because what Heimgarten is having to do now is use them conservatively, isn't he? So that's there's a there's a, a complete different strategy around going rip tear and bust once you get them on. Now Brock Feeney's into the pit lane in car number 88, so they've got two different strategies going there to make sure that they don't end up with two cars in the one spot and a double stack scenario. He was 13th coming in at that point. He lost six spots. So that's pretty tough going out there. He's also hurt by a couple of them that were on the softer tyre. Nice on the marks. Well done. Good job. Nice clean job. In and out. Managed his uh, position well. So Red Bull analysed that carefully afterwards to make sure that their drivers are pulling their cars up in the right spot. Someone's been weeding out there on the outside of the hill. There's a fair bit of junk on the road. But uh, just like it is when you turn up at a hotel and they put a gift under your pillow, a little chocolate, you get a welcome gift when you arrive at the main game at Supercars as well when you're young guy. You tend to get roughed up by everybody. So that's your welcome gift. And there's probably been a little bit of that in the opening laps for Brock as well. Our race leader is Andre Heimgartner. 3.7 seconds is the margin over Anton Di Pasquale. I think you're right. When you get into that battle, and there was a lot of hard head races just in behind where Brock Feeney was, they would have positioned the car and forced some issues that he wouldn't be aware of under normal circumstances. So this step up from Super 2 and the great pathway that he's had, getting himself into the Wing Cup replacement role is emphatic and absolutely superb job through his career to get there. And he's only 19 years of age, so there's a lot to look forward to with Brock Feeney. And also, it is a big step up in the level of in in intensity and in the way that they go about their racing in those early laps are pretty wild. The other guy that's done a really good job, Neil, was Cam Waters. He's up nine positions at this point, and his qualifying was shocking. There was no real reason for why the Tickford cars were so far down, but to get through early without any chaos, without any damage, He's done a really nice job. Got a feel for him when he's been on the podium in the runner-up position at Mount Panorama. And then they had a tough run here last year, but there was a breakthrough podium at the back end of the run in the sequence of four race meetings. But uh, the other car just didn't perform through the early part of practice and qualifying. Moment of truth now for these tyres. So on this lap, because we've got 15 in the bank, I want to understand what the lap speed is for Heimgartner and Reynolds. I spoke inside that Hino hut before about the notion of the tyre window for those tyres probably working for somewhere around 15 to 20 laps. Maybe. We'll see. The temperature is dropping. The sun's disappeared over the horizon. That changes the track temperature, which also changes the longevity of the tyre. So we'll see what that looks like. So it was a 34.8 last lap for Heimgartner, 34.8 for Di Pasquale. Reynolds did a 35.2, Ben Giz did a 34.9. And we know as uh, Thomas Randall ranges up on the outside here, this looks awkward. And Thomas drops back into position and sits in behind Todd Hazelwood, who's also switched teams over the summer break. Truck assist backing for him at Matt Stone Racing. Part of what we haven't covered very well so far is how close Di Pasquale and Ben Gisbergen are after 16 laps. So they're only one and a half seconds apart. So that's a, that's a, that bodes well. And, and before I diverted the conversation to look at these guys, where I was going with Shane, time and again last year, in a year where there were 30 races and he made the podium 23 times, he gave us all a lesson in tyre longevity and looking after them, looking after the balance, not extracting too much energy from the tyre too early. 
and he was saying on the radio earlier to Andrew Edwards that, that when he was in that battle with Will Brown, he felt like he was being pushed and that was what was making more of that understeer. He's very good at finding the right rhythm and that'll be what he's doing out there at the moment. 61 laps remain, the Borough Pairs Sydney Super Night. The lights are ablaze, Sydney Motorsport Park. And all thanks to the hardworking crew at Supercars and the Australian Racing Drivers Club for even getting this event underway. Because earlier this week, Sydney was knee deep in water. And we were fearful that we may not even have got the race meeting underway. It's already been a traumatic couple of years that everybody fully understands. So the very fact that we're able to celebrate the notion of motor racing thanks to all that hard work is deeply appreciated. But we don't want to be glib about it either. We also need to be mindful of the fact there's a lot of our fellow Australians are going through hell at the moment, up and down the East Coast with what's going on. So I, Will Brown said to me earlier in the weekend, I don't want to feel as though I'm having fun knowing that so many other people are having a tough time. So our thoughts are with those who are being affected collectively, the entire Supercars family hopes that things are going to get better and there's a lot of people that are actually contributing and doing things to help that cause, Larko? Yeah, well said, Crotbo, and I guess our job's to put a smile on their face in difficult times, so let's try and do that. Now, you talk about the pace of this super soft tyre, sometimes you've got to see it. Here's Andre Gra Heim Heim Heimgartner, sorry, about lap 19. Now, if I look at the cars around him, have a look at this. Look at that, marching away. This is a five-second gap Zero. from there to there. You asked about Dave Reynolds, look at Dave Reynolds down in here, so not making that use of that tyre anything like Andre is. Yeah, that's um, surprising. So that's a car balance issue, isn't it? So Thomas Randall comes in. So uh, cars 4, 10 and 76 also getting uh, a whack on the wrist. So Jack Smith, uh, Lee Holdsworth, Gary Jacobson in the sin bin for jumping over the kerbs. And in the background on the radio, part of the reason I paused there, which is exactly what I was suggesting earlier when everyone was giving me their prophecy about how fast the weather was going to track and get here, there's now a lot of chat on the radio that it's not it's not arriving as quickly as they thought. Ah, uh, right, OK. So it's just, it's sitting there. Now, at, uh, at Sydney Airport, they're actually forecasting it a little bit later in the evening, and it might even be after this race is completed but it's a fair way in distance terms from here. But the imperfect science of trying to work this out has been challenging everybody in the last couple of weeks because it, literally postcode to postcard, it's been the difference between heavy, wet and not. Good battle here with Will Brown, Will Davison and Chas Mostert. So they're currently in 6th, 7th and 8th. James Courtney comes in in the new opposite lock, sponsored Dickford Mustang. And that gap that Larko just gave us that great graph of pace. The first four or five cars are seeing those gaps now across the next piece of the puzzle. And that number between Di Pasquale and Van Gisberg, and that shapes up as a cracker race because it's, again, only 1.4 seconds. Cam Waters is now just past Mark Winterbottom. He's up to 12th. And I'll give you that number there for Cam because that is a really remarkable run. He's up 10 positions. Yeah. It's great going, isn't it? That's a bit of encouragement. That's a viewpoint from Mark Winterbottom. The other thing that's worth noting here, Mark, and I reckon it's always a wake-up call in your first race of the season, particularly when it's a big one like this as Cam rolls off. You've got 58 laps remaining. Long it's a way. heck of a long way. Garth? I just watched both of those Tickford pit stops, Thomas Randall and James Courtney. Both cars had a heap of junk, grass, mud in the air intake. They cleaned out the front of Randall's car, but they didn't clean out the front of Courtney's car. It was chockers full of grass. That will be something to keep an eye on as this race progresses. Cam Waters in the lane. Uh, and I think, Garth, we saw chunks of grass on the way into Turn 8. So off Corporate Hill, there's an immense amount of grass and gunned on the road there, so one of those Tickford cars have definitely been through that area. Waters and Holdsworth in the lane. And this is Cam Waters, Monster Energy. There's Lee Holdsworth, running both as champion. They're making a little ride height to each of that car, sacrificing some time in the lane to try and tidy up its behaviour. When I spoke to him after qualifying, he was shaking his head. He said he's got so much understeer, there was no evidence of it yesterday. So they're trying to make a little tweak on the run there. 
Well, and to your point, with 58 laps to go, you might as well give it a tweak. Because with 58 laps to go, it's going to be a dog for the rest of the night. So you give it a tweak, see what happens. It's a couple of stops, all the things, bit of weather to come, whatever. But however that plays out, no use wobbling around with the car no. so imbalanced. No, the three or four or five seconds it might take to do the tweak can come back to you as a dividend in lap time. Ben Gisbergen in. So this is a big part of the story. And what tyres are they going to put on this car? Soft. So they're holding the grippy tyre until later. They want to see what the weather's going to do. Brody Kostecki, Boost Mobile entry, he's in. And is that super soft going on that car? I can't actually see how it looks like it. Yeah. So that looked like a pretty standard stop there for Shane. And nice straightforward stop there for uh, Brody. So for Shane, not a huge amount of fuel. 40 40 wise. Yeah. He's got 100 to put in. Long stint, this one. Big one. Yeah. It's going to ask a lot of the tyre through this stint. And ended up with the two Red Bull Ampol Racing entries. Very close on the racetrack. Meantime, the margin is five seconds between Heimgartner and Dick Pasquale. We've got a nice rhythm at the moment. Heimgartner. A bit of a bobble there for Will Brown. Up in the top corner. He's got pressure from the other Will, Will Davison at the moment. And uh, Will Brown peels off and brings it into the lane. So this is a race where you're going to see people peel off in different directions with their strategies and they'll all meet up further down the road on the last load of fuel. And this will help Will Davison a little bit now with some fresh air around that car. When you're following that close, it hurts the front tyre, it hurts the water temp. We'll keep an eye on that water temp comment that Garth made about Courtney as well. I think you're right, I think it was all that rubbish we saw on the outside corporate hill. The other part is that gap has stabilised now. Yeah, well, the Heimgart and the Deep Pasquale gap has stabilised. So on well. Larko's graph in the Hino Hub, that will be much more linear now. So we said a little while ago, about three or four laps ago, that it was five seconds. It's only 5.3 seconds now. So a little bit of the goodness, the pace of the super soft tyre after 21 laps, just starting to evaporate. Big lock up, David Reynolds. Well, the place is notorious for eating Dunlop tyres. It, it's one of the hardest tracks, if not the hardest. The load in the turn one alone is a nine second turn. Average turning time here is just under seven seconds per corner. So it's got a very different rhythm to many other racetracks. When you go to a street circuit, for example, short, sharp, 90 degree turns, point squirt. This one, you load the car. Bathurst, by comparison, big, open and flowing all across the top of the hill. Please settle it down there, Will Davison. I thought he was going to drill the back of David Reynolds' Mustang there. Whoa. I'll bet he did for a moment there. Maybe it was worse from the angle that we were seeing. Price forwards in as well in the Midi's electrical racing entry. Check out the replay. Will's arrived here, full bonsai mode, locked everything up, locked the fronts, then the rears. So, nice stop. Gets those super softs off. Dave Reynolds, okay, Ken Wright, Mustang, Bo Repairs, Helmer Cam. I love that shot. Put you right into the thick of the action. Still clear. Clear. And I'm just looking Still down clear. there, young okay, man, okay, okay. as to who's Green. put super softs Green. on. Well, I think it was only Kostecki that we saw, was it? It was the only one that I could, I could see that when he left, he went to a super soft. We haven't got that yet. Lee Holdsworth is on them at the moment on our numbers. David Reynolds is still on his. Pitha, who's just come in, there he is. Look at the front of the car. They, they, they turned up here earlier in the week and they all look like they were ready for a motor show. And then after they do a few laps, they look like they've been sandblasted and beaten to death. 
Just a quick update on who has taken their super soft tyre. Yes, Brody Kostecki, Will Brown, Will Davison just took his. Bryce Forward just left with super soft tyres. So lots of super soft tyres going on at this second stop. I also just jumped into the Tickford garage and had a chat with Sam Scafidi, James Courtney's engineer, asked about the engine temps. He said they're OK at the moment. That's good. Thanks for the update. Important. Car number three exceeding track limits. Also been given a bad sportsmanship flag for Tim Slade. Now this is interesting, Mark, because 24 laps in now for Heimgartner on the super soft tyre. So its range is turning out to exceed expectation once again. The pace of it is actually going the other way now. So it's Deeper Squally that's actually a little bit quicker and the margin is crushing between first and second. But um, I didn't expect, and in fact, I went into the Brad Jones truck and I can promise you they didn't expect to see that sort of longevity out of that tyre. That's excellent, absolutely excellent. But what he did is he didn't go too hard too early, and even when he got to the lead, he didn't press on too hard. So, yes, that gap got out to 5.3, and now, yes, it's stabilised a little, but that's gone far further than anyone expected. So, nice job. Automotive Superstore backing for Macaulay Jones this weekend. Fuel goes in at 33 quarter litres per second. It's the governing factor in that stop. The wheels and tyres go on pretty quickly and easily as we pick up on Brock Feeney here. Brock's had one stop. He's sitting in 10th at the moment. He's in behind Jack LeBrock and in front of uh, David Reynolds. A bit of fresh air behind him at the moment. Heimgartner's in. Our race leader's in with a four-second lead. And so is Deeper Squally. So let's keep an eye on what these two do with tyres. <laughs> so Anton shadows him. That's smart. They're putting 19 seconds of fuel in Heimgartner's car. Pick that up on the radio. Here he is, RJ Battery's entry for Brad Jones Racing. This is a great start to his new team hey, well partnership. Done, mate. We're just waiting on fuel. At this stage, you're clear what? to drop off the road. Let's have a look. Can you see the whether they're blue? They are. Yeah, very yep. So they're clear. living for go, the go, now. Go, go. Ludo's decided to put the super soft Dunlop on. So it's a crisscross. So Heimgartner's now on the soft tyre. Di Pasquale's on the super soft tyre. And it won't be conservative for Heimgartner this time because it'll be ripped here and bust. Press on hard. I, my woman's intuition's telling me they put more fuel in Di Pasquale's car then. Do they? You might be right. But the gap was four and a half seconds. And I'll give you the gap. And so they put 72 litres in Anton's car in 67. Yeah, a little bit more fuel in car 11 at 67 for Heimgartner. Five, five litres. Yeah. yeah. Just felt like it sat there just a tiny bit longer. So it was about another second and a half, couple of seconds. Mark Winterbottom's come in. We're only just picking up our coverage. Scott Pye went out early with a power steering fail and the Seiko 5 racing entry for Team 18. And that guy there that's just disappearing out of frame on the exit of Turn 5 has led the first chunk of the race, Andre Heimgartner. He's gone from the super soft tyre to the soft. His opening stint was very strong. He passed three or four cars on the way to getting into the lead. And the guy that's been hounding him has gone on to the softer of the two tyre variants. So Mostert's our new leader. Tim Slade's just peeled into the pits in the cool drive entry. And he's being followed by Nick Perkat in the Mobile One NTI racing entry. Three. Yeah, 2014, I think that was. Oh, they've got a drama here. And, uh, yeah, that rattle gun was fouled under the wheels. This, they Actually, they may have been covered by fuel here and got away with this one, or have they? Or are they putting more fuel in it? Because the, they may as well. Yeah, I think there was a bit of that in it. I reckon that wasn't to plan. That was no good. So you can see the fuel rig operator was actually watching what was happening on the left rear there, and he may have covered them by sticking a bit more fuel in the process. Guys, no good yanking it off. Subway entry, Premier Hire Racing, Peter Gibber's car. This is Gary Jacobson, continuity on his side. He's put in some pretty fine performances through the 2021 season, hoping to build on it this year. The Slade goes out after that very slow stop. Whoa! Will Whoa. Brown. Whoa. Oh. 
That's a yeehaw moment. Oh, how good's that? You don't know when you're coming back out where the cars are. You're totally blinded. And that was a nice moment. So here we are, we're on board with Heimgart. Now watch this. Oh, it cut past at about 230k. And he's able to get away with it. Will Brown, nice job. Also, nice job, Heimgartner. So remember, with Brown, they only put 56 litres of fuel in the car. So uh, he's got a little track position gain out of that as a result of having slightly less time stationary yeah, on the money, on the in the boost mobile entry. Mostert in, okay, race done. leader, and Just not super softs. So he's all doing the same thing as Van Gisbergen. So Van Gisbergen will assume all the clear. lead here. Be ready for it. Be ready for How it. much fuel did he put in? Van Gis? Right. 41. Go, go, go. Yeah, yeah. Not, not a lot. So that's why he's jumped the queue. Yeah. If you think about the him versus, say, 70 litres, or close enough to 70 litres for Heimgartner and Di Pasquale, he's 30 litres less. So. Van Gisberg at the moment with less fuel on board, that's given him a yield and got to the front. In fact, Brock Fenney's the car in behind. Now there's Mostert and Cam Waters. They've had plenty of wild moments over the years, as either as teammates or rivals in separate teams. It's magnificent, though. Aren't they? And that number, just so that you, when you were talking about the slight disparity in fuel, when Heimgartner and Dick Squally left, it was exactly four and a half seconds. So the number coming into the pit was the same after the pit stop. Van Gisbergen leads from young Brock Feeney, he's only 19 years of age. So that weather is just ever so gently creeping closer. Ever so gently is it? at the moment, yeah. But coming up to uh, roughly five minutes to eight Eastern summer time in Sydney talking about the possibility of heavier rain about now. Nothing's arrived so, so far. And it's Sydney the possibility of a thunderstorm about an hour from now, which is probably about right. But the reality is we're, only, we're really a third of the way into the race. So we've got 50 laps to go. We've got 200 kilometres to go. <laughs> so yeah, hard work. Plenty of stuff to happen yet. So at the moment, our leaders are Van Gisbergen and Feeney. We're looking at the battle here with Cam Waters, Todd Hazelwood. These guys are 13th and 14th, and in the lane is Jack LeBrock, teammate to Hazelwood. The tear-off being pulled off the screen on the front of the car. They load about four or five of those on the front of the screen. It's a polycarbonate screen in a supercar. It's not glass. Go, 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 go. Done, gone, serviced and away. So most amount of fuel Remember, they sat Slade there Tim for Slade. quite some time. That was 81 litres, and I reckon that was to cover what was going on with that problem with the run gun on the left rear corner. Least amount of fuel. I reckon it's 34. Oh, yeah, OK. Yeah. yeah, but then they've just we just saw that other stop where they put 55-odd litres. But, yeah, Shane's down the scale there as well. 40-odd litres of yeah, so, well, the, the thing is, when Garth told us earlier that LeBrock was on a three-stopper, that's their strategy, isn't it? Yeah. 34 and then 55. Yeah. But of the two stoppers, Van Gisbergen clearly has put the least amount of fuel at the front runners. Corley Jones and Lee Holtzworth. Still going. Still doing their tricks on the exit of turn six. Tim Slade in there, mixed into this one as well. Pace is still not too bad. Last lap for Vangersbergen was a 33-3. Will Brown did the same. Brock Finney on 34-9. David Reynolds 33-7. Heimgartner 33-5. What has Anton done? Anton's 33 flat near enough. And uh, how's he faring, Anton? Is he who's the quickest out there at the moment? Say, but that's on the super soft. Yeah, and Di Pasquale's second fastest. So, as you'd expect, Anton's going to nurse those tyres as best he can, but he'll be floating somewhere near the pointiest end of current lap speed. Dave Reynolds actually just moved up one spot. Now, oh, here we are, we picked it up. So he's just grabbed a spot on Brock Feeney, who's about to be assaulted by Andre Heimgartner down the inside. Forty-nine laps remain. Van Gisbergen's the leader with 8.4 seconds in hand. This little battle's flaring up at the moment. Heimgartner just snipped Brock Feeney 
De Pasquale and Kostecki lurking around in this one as well. In the foreground, it's okay, David Reynolds. About five miles on that side. So that was Mark Short talking to Brock Feeney. And uh, Will Brown's talking about something related to the screen on his car. Well, given the amount of people that have been off the road and some of the power steering stuff that we saw early, it could be a bit of oil and water of that one that's pretty ordinary, but as Deeper Squally now turns the tide, soft uh, tyre on Heimgartner, super soft on Anton's car, straight down the inside, nicely done. Yeah, so he's just done to Andre what Andre did to Anton earlier in the sequence, flipped it around the other way. So that's a positional gain for Anton. He's moved up into fourth position now. He's 11 and a half seconds from the lead. So Van Gisbergen's just strolling along nicely out there at the moment. He's on the soft tyre. Will Brown is on the super soft tyre. Should have a little bit more pace. 8.7 seconds is the margin there. Then David Reynolds sitting in third position. He's on a soft tyre. All of that data is up there on the left-hand side of your screen. And we've got that new cover on the side wall of the Dunlop Super Soft for 2022. And there's a couple of other people that uh, probably just, I mean, the race is, is a little bit complicated at the moment, Mark, but there are a few people. Cam Waters has floated nearer the top. I think Percat hasn't fully recovered from that difficult Kirk strike that he got in qualifying, but this is the story. And uh, I can hear uh, Richard Holway talking to Scott Pye at the moment, saying we've got fresh rubber on it. So they must have fixed the power steering. But uh, you can see Katoomba up on the Blue Mountains. They'll be getting a bath up there at the moment, Chad. Guys, I've decided to come down to Turn 1 and watch the cars through here. It is unbelievably fast. 270 kilometres an hour on approach. They kick it back to fifth gear and 215 k's through the middle of the corner. It is an unbelievable spot to watch down here. These guys are super quick in this very spot of the racetrack. Best seat in the house, isn't it, Jack? Those things are quick down there. It actually looks better from the driver's seat than it does when you're standing there. It's spooky standing there. <laughs> In the driver's seat, it's all, you know, like, that's what you do. When you stand there, it's crazy. So Di Pasquale continues to move forward now on uh, David Reynolds. He's moved up one more spot. So Van Gisbergen, 8.6 seconds. So he's still got that same flat margin. Remembering, too, there's a, a double whammy effect here that the super soft tyre is giving Di Pasquale a yield in terms of his pace. But remember, he's effectively put... 30 litres, get the number, yeah, 30 litres, 72 litres went on board for Di Pasquale, 41 for Van Gisbergen, so 30 litres more. Okay, 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 okay. And that's made the discrepancy in that vehicle position. So he's 11 seconds, Di Pasquale is 11 seconds behind Shane Van Gisbergen. Most of that is because of that fuel load discrepancy. It's a chunky difference between them, so... I mean, it's good when they do that because it gives us something to chew on, something to think about. 46 laps remain, 77 lap journey this evening, and everybody has done their first stop. A couple of, of the three stoppers have already injected an additional stop into the process. They include Jack LeBrock and Macaulay Jones that we just saw on screen. And Scott Pye, as I said a few moments ago, being told by Richard Holway he's got fresh tyres and sending him back out there. Bunnings trade power pass here. So this is down at turn six and Andre Heimgartner getting up the inside of Brock Feeney and doing this pretty nicely. Riding with David Reynolds in the process. Just in that phase of the race for these guys at the moment where it's also when you get that wake up call from a fatigue standpoint when you haven't been in the race car for three months, exactly 90 days yep. since they were last in them. It's hot, sweaty, particularly if you haven't got a nice car. So, on his trade power pass there. So, nice work. There's been a few moves up and down the field. A couple of people have made good, solid progress. But if you've got an awkward car out there at the moment and they come on the radio and tell you you've still got 46 laps to go, it's like, this is fun. 
I think early in this in the season, I used to always say to the guys, don't tell me until there's 10 laps to go. Because yeah. you just you just don't want to know. It's only a bad news story. That's it. <laughs> Heimgartner sitting currently in fifth position. He's got the fastest lap of the race. He achieved that on the super soft tyre. He did it on lap two. His opening stint was ideal. It was nice. It was a nice clean job. He's 13 seconds from the lead. And fuel-wise, they took 67 litres in that car. So only five litre difference between he and Di Pasquale, and they've alternated now in their tyres. They've flipped around what they're both doing. And have a look at the pace. The super soft tyre, fastest lap of the race is Heimgartner with the super soft. Will Brown's done a 31.65, so 300 slower than Heimgartner. Anton Di Pasquale did a 31.87. The interesting one was Slade. Slade's done a 31.68, so he's almost done the same pace on the super soft as the absolute front runners. Slade at the moment uh, is further down the order in 16. Yeah, it's not a big variance, is no. it? You can see witness marks on the edge of the road, several spots around here. There's been a few wild adventures so far this weekend of people going off the road. One of them was Anton yesterday in practice between turns one and two. He flew off the road on the edge of turn one and it was a dead set 300 or 400 metre journey all the way down to the rice paddy down the other end. He made all the way almost to the safety fence down there and uh, no damage done to the car but a huge clean up job last night. The pace of the cars down the bottom of the straight here is enormous. They're doing 270 kilometres an hour. Their slowest speed in turn one is around about 215 k's when the tyres are fresh. It requires big commitment and they're getting deeper and deeper and deeper into that corner. So there's a bit of a game between the drivers to see how far they can get in. That's what Jack was looking at a few moments ago. They go howling past that 100 metre board down there, actually turning the car in, still committed on the throttle before they just brush the brake, feed it fifth gear try to hit that apex and get out the other side. Yeah, it's a wild corner. It would be a wild corner if we added a little bit of water to it, because it was pretty... Uh, when, when we think about last year and when it was wet, <laughs> the Kai's are arriving down there with a visibility pool. That's what makes it hard. You don't really know where the edge of the road is, and you've got the car on the slide, you're trying to pick where you can get back on the throttle again. There's a lot of complexity that ends up getting built into that corner as soon as you put a bit of water on it. So Van Gisbergen, 8.8 .8 seconds over Will Brown at the moment. Things are just quiet while they settle in in this stint. It's a watching brief. And it'll light up in the final segment of the race as we work out who's done what with tyres and how they've played the fuel game. They had to bring on 140 litres of fuel into the car and looking at Barry Ryan in the bottom right hand of the screen together with Tom Moore at the Erebus Boost Mobile Racing and then Dick Johnson up there in the Shell V Power Racing Team garage. Bathurst champion, legend of the Sport Hall of Famer, touring car champion. Freedom. Freedom. Old of at speed cam, have a go at that pace down there, 270 kilometres an hour. And that screen does not look very nice. I heard some complaints earlier regarding people's screens. The Anton Di Pasquale screen is average with a capital A. Yeah, I'm looking at the bottom of it. So it looks like it's actually had, that has definitely had some oil. Just see those stripes on the left-hand side. You can see there the amount of dirt and water that we've been... Different. Talking about the amount of rain that we had through the course of this week, and in these Valunga curves, those curves there, those sawtooth curves, there's a lot of water that just hides in there. And Anton and Ludo are having a pretty healthy exchange there about tyres and what they're going to do in terms of policy. I know, boss, but you're the best. <laughs> Ludo just said to him, he said, I know boss, but you are the best. So he's trying to pump his tyres up to make those tyres live for as long as possible. <laughs> so Ludo's become a car salesman in the middle of this race, trying to keep his driver optimistic and certainly glass half full as to how you make those tyres live. Van Gisbergen with a 8.8 second lead. Remember, he put a very small amount of fuel on board compared to many of the others. 30 litres less than Deep Pasquale. 
and he came in a bit earlier, four laps earlier than Anton. So that's why I've just been studying some of these numbers. So when you stop and consider the difference in their fuel, it's about eight seconds of fuel difference. And in is Brock Feeney now for uh, his second stop. 42 laps remain. We're coming up now to the one hour mark of racing. Race number one, the Borough Pairs Sydney Supernights. Event number one, the Repco Supercars Championship. Curb cam view of turn Ooh. number one. Oh, that was a slide there from Waters and then a great save in behind from Hazelwood. Two big moments on the outside of that corner at over 220k. Super soft tyre goes on to Brock Feeney's car. You see the refuelling rig, which one hose is delivering fuel, one is dealing with the vent. And away he goes. So he's just getting information on who he's going to be meeting on the exit, and it's Chris Pitha that he'll see on the racetrack when Brock Feeney makes his way back out there. One laps remain. 77 lap race to open the Ripco Supercars Championship of a brand new season. And the race is in an intriguing state at the moment. Van Gisbergen, our reigning champion, has got the lead. He's got the lead by virtue of having pitted slightly earlier, about four laps earlier than Anton Di Pasquale and Andre Heimgartner. And in vague terms, about 30 litres different in the fuel. So he'll sit still for longer when he takes this next stop. That was lively for Cam Waters. It was quite a big catch through turn one there. And uh, What's this? actually both of them. So for Todd Hazelwood, he had the right rear actually dropping off the edge of the curb. So they were both pretty lively down there. I was focused on car six. You were the one watching 35. Both of us ducked. <laughs> exactly. Because that's where you said yesterday that Anton went off. You can see those tramp tracks of where Anton went off right down to the blower screen at the end of that big grass section into turn two. He was off the road for three or four hundred metres as we look at Nick Perkat trying to do the crisscross, but he got himself into the weeds and there's his... Oh, my God, that was close. He tried to cover down on Hazelwood, but he come out of the, out of the grass and there's a dive by Mark Winterbottom. That's a great pass. That is a very, very good pass. Impromptu, spontaneous, bang, down the inside, authoritative, and Hazelwood was not ready for that car to arrive. In fact, when he was going to turn into turn five, there was nothing uh, there. He wouldn't have realised there was the, an uh, Irwin Commodore about to embark on a move. Beautifully done, Mark Winterbottom. So Hazelwood was three spots up the road because he was he was battling with Percat, and Percat has now just evaporated. He's gone. That was a great exchange. Anton Di Pasquale has been warned about exceeding track limits out there. And all Pocat slides are up on the inside of Waters. He did that nicely and he's got away with it too. That moves him up into 11th position. Good job. Has he got super softs on? I've got to look there. No. It, looked like it, like it looked like it had so much grip, didn't it, when it fired yeah. down there, but he didn't. So nicely done, Nick Percat. That was a great move. And he, he, he held off when all that drama was unfolding. Have a look at this, the Bunnings Trade Power Pass. Check this out. He made his way into the grass. That was his mistake. Now watch him come out. He fires straight across. Hazelwood's down the inside, cuts him off. But what it does, it slows Hazelwood down. Check out Mark Winterbottom. He says, have a look at me. Bang, down the inside, got him. <laughs> yeah, you can't blink in this, this game. You give anybody even the slightest incentive and hit, in they go. Here's the viewpoint from on board with Mark. Bang. Shifted it down a gear to be able to pop out the other side. So presence of mind there was great. He was switched on, got the job done. Nice moves there. I love those ones. And this is a good battle because Will Brown has probably held off Anton Di Pasquale for longer than I thought he would. I thought Anton would be able to round him up. So Erebus Pace, we said early in the race on the same tyre as Van Gisbergen, that he was right on Shane. So Will Brown's pace, tyre for tyre, was excellent. This is, is this the Percat one? Yeah, here we go. 
So Perkett's able to half mimic the, the initial dive. He doesn't get the nose of the Commodore down the inside of camp. He very wisely parks it off there, turns in early, slides it down the inside, fires the left-hand front wheel across the inside curve and says, thank you, I've taken it from you. Nice job. So we've got Brody Kostecki in, Cam Waters is now in as well. Here we go. Whoa. Dives it down. That was the one that I remarked on from the outside where she had the big slide right in the middle of the turn between 10 and 11. Didn't matter. He was able to make the pass, the Bunnings Trade Power Pass of the day. Nice one for Nick Perkett there. So Brody now departs. I've been focusing on some numbers in the background while you were getting excited about all that stuff, Scopey. So Shane, in, these are approximates, needs around about 26 seconds of fuel. Van Gisbergen, our race leader at the moment, he's got 10.6 seconds. Dipper Squirrelly needs about 16 seconds of fuel. And uh, Heimgartner needs about 19. I need to just focus on Will Brown for a minute in this story as well, so I'll come back to you on that one. OK, so I'm just hearing... Malaka, what do you reckon about the weather? Oh, I've got Mark Dutton here, we'll just ask him. Hey, Dutto, we're hearing a little bit of radio chat from Shane, maybe some engine dramas, maybe some backfiring lack of power. Yeah, I mean, edge, engine power and acceleration looks fine. That's all we can sort of see, so we'll, uh, we'll just keep trucking on. Yeah, well, people don't know. You're watching all the alarms here, and I see you're not panicking, so you're not overly worried. No, no, yeah, it looks like it's something minor. We, we can't see it, we're just going off what he says. But you can, you can see from the speed graphs that he's accelerating as hard as ever, so should be good. Bring on the rain. <laughs> yeah, he said on the radio a few minutes ago that he's having to use more throttle angle in more places. So it might be a mapping thing. Uh, there might even be some mechanical issue with the throttle on it. Reynolds in. So that's not good. I just heard someone say there's some rain on the screen just then. Uh, I think I'm, it was Scott High. So the answer to the question about Will Brown that I'm asking yeah. myself... Yeah, how'd you go with that? 22 seconds. Good. Do you often do that? Red. And as you can see, Dave Reynolds has just pulled into his pit bay with a Penrite Racing Group. Uh, they have got a dropping gearbox oil and gearbox pressure is rising, so definitely an issue for them. OK, not a good start, unfortunately. So uh, that's breathing bad fumes inside that garage. So uh, tough break there. David Reynolds has been showing pace. So here we go. So they were talking about light rain, but they were talking about it arriving an hour ago. Craig Lowndes has leapt to his feet down there cheering. He didn't do that when he was in the things. Now, Shane Van Gisbergen almost went off the road behind Cam Waters a second ago, coming onto the straight. I don't know what happened. I looked up and all of a sudden Van Gisbergen was one back and one wide, right off the, off the racetrack almost. So I don't know whether there was a little bump or he just missed the line and got it caught with the debris and rubble on the outside of the road, just kept him out there. So I'm not really quite sure as to what happened. Will Brown and Deep Pasquale continue to have this battle for second. There's nothing in these two. So if you look at where Anton sits on the road at the moment, he's 11, well, near enough to 12 seconds behind. Basically, Will Brown and Anton Deep Pasquale are 0.4 second apart, so call them 11 to 12 seconds behind. 10 second difference in, yeah. in fuel. Yeah. Yep. But a soft tyre to put on. Well, a super soft weather. Mm. So you've got to keep in mind what's going on out there weather-wise at the moment. So that, that's going to be the really interesting question. Well, it has been all night, but, that, but that's the intrigue now. Oh, he gives him a bump and he pushes him wide. That was always going to happen there. He tried to faint left, he went, and he flicked down to the right, Deep Pasquale, and he ended up just resting the Shell Mustang. I know, I was saying about that screen earlier. circuit has been declared wet. I repeat, the circuit has been declared, declared wet. wet. Here we go. So that's, I think, why I saw Shane almost go off the road before, that maybe it actually rained on that end of the track more than we think. Yeah, and did you see the view from Anton's seat? That's that was horrible. Was terrible. Yeah. And he's probably reluctant to activate the wiper because often when you've got all that junk all over the screen like that and you sweep it, it gets worse. Been standing in pit lane and Neil and Mark, you guys have been selling the dream that it's going to rain. We just heard James Taylor, race director from Motorsport Australia, say the track is declared wet. There is the finest amount of rain falling in pit lane right now. Those of you that wear glasses would know if you looked at the sky, it's really annoying when you've got your glasses on. It's at that, that annoying phase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dear, annoying phase. All right, so 
there's a 10 second difference in fuel between Anton Di Pasquale and Shane Van Gisbergen. Anton's in a slightly better position than Will Brown and Andre Heimgartner, and there's a 12 second difference on the racetrack. So no surprise, the math works out that things are very tight. And these are all theories that you've got to keep weighing the current practicalities into. The current lap speed, are they making mistakes? Is someone locking a brake and running wide in a corner? Is traffic becoming an effect in the story as well? I can't so, see him on my windshield. Can you tell him it's raining? I can't see anything. So, so, there you go. The, so straight away, not being able to see is going to compromise Anton's lap speed. He can't see, doesn't know whether it's... Stop, boss. We're doing this stop. Let's drive nice and smooth. We've got another 10 to do. Thank you. We've got 10 laps to go, Ludo just said. Oh, that, I wouldn't want to hear that. It's raining because I can't see. So I can't tell. I'm just driving once. I'm just guessing. So he's asking Ludo to help him here. He wants him to tell him how hard it's raining because he can't see. That windscreen is disgraceful. Here comes the leader, Van Giersbergen. 35 laps remaining. We know he's got to put circa 100 litres in this car. Roughly 26 seconds of fuel. And you'll now see those super soft tyres fitted. That spells grip. But the track condition is challenging out there. But in these conditions, you'd want the softest tyre you could get onto the car. Critical stint now for Shane Van Gisbergen, who's pulled up perfectly on the mark. And off he goes on a cold tyre. He's just got to bring them in gently now. But he's got a long, long way to go. 35 laps to get to the chequered flag. On a greasy track, maybe. But will it end up being full wet? More super softs. This is James Courtney's opposite lock entry. So Garth Tander reported annoying levels of rain. This is a nice pass, a critical pass actually by Anton. He only just got it made. In fact, it looked like Will Brown was going to do the crisscross and go back up the inside. So have a look at this out of five. Uses the road nicely and then plunges down the inside into six. He had to run a little bit wide. Then Will turns it back. He looked like he was going to get back up the inside at the next one at Corporate Hill. And Will decided just to come out of the throttle there because they could have had a bump over the hill. Imagine if they could both see where they were going. Yeah, it'd be good racing, wouldn't it? <laughs> so Anton's in way worse condition for visibility than Will, but his thing wasn't flash either. They've both got a lot of junk on the screen, which will be attended to in the stop. So he's now got a three second margin, Di Pasquale, and he is 39, 38 seconds up the road from uh, Shane Van Gisbergen. So he's sliding it around quite a lot. And Ludo just said you've got 10 laps to go. Interesting to see if he can make that tyre live, especially when he was parked in behind Will Brown for those laps. Tyres overheat, brakes overheat, drivers overheat. So Di Pasquale from Brown, Heimgartner, Davison, Mostert, Fullwood, Perkat, Slade, Van Gisbergen, Winterbottom, that's the current 10. Of the people in terms of winners and losers at the moment. We really can't do that for you properly until we get through this next series of stops and we also work out what's going to happen with tyres. Jack? Hey guys, just watching uh, the Erebus crew get ready. It's worth pointing out they've had a relationship with the Army since 2016. On the right rear is a guy called Josh, straight out of the Army, straight into these pit stops, and we know how high pressure situation that can be, especially with the form Erebus had last year in their pit stops. Get ready to go. Yeah, you need everything going for you, as you well know, Jack. Will Brown is now in. Go, go, go. So Heimgartner's now eight and a half seconds behind Di Pasquale. Will Davison's about a second and a half behind Heimgartner as Will Brown peels in. So I'm staggered that Di Pasquale can press on as he is yep. with that level of visibility on the screen at the moment, Mark. That, that was shocking, and he was able to make a good pass on Will Brown. Essential, yeah. Ah, hello, I can see you now. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you now. Uh, 14 seconds. 
He's got a gag going. Is that Barry? <laughs> yeah. So Will just yelled out to Barry, oh, I can see you now. <laughs> he's, got a, he's got a windscreen gag going in the middle of a stop. He's a good young bloke, isn't he? He's very funny. Yeah, the biz was shocking. Todd Hazelwood's in the lane there as well. Imagine what Anton's going to say in the middle of his stop. It'll be a hallelujah moment for him. <laughs> no doubt. Brody Kostecki, where is Brody? He's currently 10th. We haven't really made much of a fuss of where we are. And we're trying to sort ourselves out as to how the super soft tyre is going to work for Van Gisbergen. Because remember, he's got to make those lifts for like 35 laps, basically, wasn't it? Big job. Big job. But remember, he did that at the end of last year. He was unbelievable. And this is the wheel shot. See the brake duck there. The Dunlop sign, the boost sign. All that orange scat tubing that connects the composite Kevlar duct. And that then hooks to the upright to bleed off as much air into that brake as possible. You see Kostecki get a nice move made there on Mark Winterbottom. Coming on to the straight now. Just trying to see how many cars are on the Super Soft. So obviously Kostecki's on it now and he's making ground, so that's now ninth. And we know that Shane Van Gisbergen is too. Long way to go. 32 laps remaining. Shane Van Gisbergen on this lap mark's just done a personal best in sector one. Remember, he's gone onto the super soft tyre, so he's got grip on his side, but he's got that delicate balance to deal with of how to manage the pace and the longevity of the tyre in what's potentially a long stint. Harry Jacobson sitting in 16th position at the moment in the subway entry. And I'm just having a look onto the radar sweep on my phone. And again, it's actually cleared the mountains now, and I'm, it'll be just out in the, uh, the far west. So it, it continues to threaten, coming up to 25 odd minutes past 8 o'clock Eastern Summer Time in Sydney. And the chances are that we will likely to see something on the Sydney airport forecast. I think they were talking about it around about 9 o'clock or thereabouts. So it's inching in. Is it going to be a factor now in this race? And did you look at Bankstown also? Bankstown's not that far away, is it? It's probably what... Yeah, it's not updated as frequently. on board now with Gary Jacobson on board the Subway Commodore and we were teased last year quite a lot by Gary deciding to left foot or right foot brake and he's using the left foot brake technique in that phase of the racetrack sometimes you can actually in a couple of these corners you can left foot brake but then right foot brake in the bigger ones. Forward and Winterbottom are in the pit lane now. It's down into turn one. He'll give it another little dab in between those two corners to make sure he's got a full brake way into turn two. Just looking for pace on the racetrack there right now. The second fastest was actually Jake Kostecki on the previous lap. The fastest car is Jack Smith, so there's, as the people put tyres on and how hard they drive them, it's very different up and down the field. Dick Pasquale was 17th fastest on the previous lap. Van Gisbergen was second, well, actually he was third and he's just gone to second on this lap. Nice foot cam work there and this is a good battle. So, Heimgartner is trying to keep that group at bay. Mark Winterbottom having a little peek down the inside. That's where we saw that break pass in between these two corners, between five and six. And he's going to try the same thing on Heimgartner, and he gets it done easily. Nicely done on the super soft tyre. 
30 laps remain. Event one, Repco Supercars Championship. Tonight is the Borough Pairs Sydney Super Night. And uh, that's a lot of racing to come. And the complexion of the race is that with one stop done, Anton Di Pasquale's got a 10.9 second margin over Andre Heimgartner from Will Davis and Chas Mostert. Shane Van Gisberg in his neck. Now Shane's done his second stop. Different people on different strategies here and remembering also that Van Gisbergen's three stopping in the, in the structure of his race. Yeah. So I'm just looking at I'll actually just focus on this for a moment before I get too tangled in strategy because this is a bit lively here at the moment. Oh and runs out of road Jack Smith and Andre Heimgartner. That was awkward. Teammates. <laughs> it was it was awkward. All right, that's a very good explanation for it. So, a healthy battle going on there with Heimgartner and Davison. Jack Smith got caught up with Macaulay Jones in it. They all bump coming on to the main straight. Jack ends up out in the weeds. It's an awkward moment there. It's actually faster than you think as you come onto the straight there. It doesn't look that fast, but just the exit speed straight away is Roughly the, ooh, sorry, the slowest part of that is about 100k. By the time they got to that spot where Jack was going off the road, probably 130 or 140k. As we look at Mostert now putting the super soft tyre on. I'm done. We are clear in the lane, clear in the lane. So be ready, be ready. Still clear. Be ready to go, be ready to go. So there's a lot. It's Anthony yeah, McDonald on the here. radio there. Chaz has been very experienced. He's been doing that with that team for a long, long time. And it's always calm, good messaging, no drama, heightened voice or any level of anxiousness from Macca when he does that. And now Jack Smith gets back past Davison after that little roll through the weeds. Here we go. Now watch this. So he's around the outside. Davison fires down the inside. And then Heimgartner moves out. He doesn't know that Jack's there. And then they end up making awkward contact with the teammates. And Jack then gets it back on the road and is able to do that reasonably efficiently, actually. Well, and it could have resulted in Andre flipping around the front of it and then firing to the right-hand side of the road. This is the onboard view with, with Jack. Right now is where you could put the driver in front out in so right there what neil's talking about is if you make any heavier contact you go in the right hand fence Heimgartner now in for his stop will davison's come in there as well here he is on okay, mate, well done. On three seconds clear to go on the drop <laughs> He's got a 22 second margin over Shane Van Gisbergen. That was a good call. Yeah. That would have been contact for sure. And nicely done also by Will Davison because he, he didn't give too much away when he did it. And he's straight down the inside. Does he get that thing stopped? He does now. I reckon he might have the super soft on that car 17. I didn't, I didn't really pick up in the stop. A rickety mark. It hasn't, it hasn't come up on our timing yet. It's not showing. We'll see the blue sidewall in a moment. If it is there. Sorry, oh, no. we just heard it. Garth, Garth just said it's a soft. Yeah, that's what I would have been doing too, Brad. Yeah, there's a bit of stress involved in that image that you just saw. That, that's very important because at the moment, if Heimgarten is going to be any sort of a threat to Di Pasquale, just this track decision that he's just lost is going to burn him. He, he, tear off. He, he wants to tear off. Done. And everyone's complaining about it. Everybody. So the, the windscreen quality or the visibility for everyone has been shocking. But that was a big move by Davison then because he was able to capitalise. It was a really impromptu straight down the inside. And Heimgartner probably wasn't really ready for that one. But he got caught out. A nice move by Will Davison. Good pace again from Shane Van Gisbergen on his way. 27 to get home. Is there drink down? Is there drink down or...? 
catch his remark then. So let's have a look at the replay as they rejoin down here and you'll see this great move that Mark was describing. Opportunistic. The gap was there and he's fired out. I, I don't reckon Andre thought that was going to happen. So uh, straight down the inside on the cold time made it work. Not an easy thing to do because if you get too over optimistic in that process, you'll lock a brake, flat spot a tyre and then you carry it for the rest of the stint. And looking at the pace now, Heimgarten has probably got better pace than what Will's got. That's going to cost him a little bit of time too because it chews the tyre, hurts the engine temp, hurts the brakes in the process, but he is all over the back of him. Now these guys are down in 11th and 12th at the moment. They're both on the soft tyre. He's going to get him up the inside here. He's got slightly better traction. I don't know that he's far enough up. Yeah. Oh, it's awkward. Oh, it's awkward. Oh, That's not quite. That's a nearly but not quite that one. It's enough to be an annoyance. And then for Will, it's hard because you can sense him there, but you don't want to turn down to the ideal line. You have a chance to rotate around the front bumper. That's a fast corner. It's roughly 200k. So by the time you come into that zone, you've got to get yourself organised to know that you're confident to turn the car in. This is turning a little bit better, this car that we're riding with at the moment. Just You just saw in the second phase of that, it's really one big corner, 10 and 11. It just looked a little bit stronger in the mid corner at the, at the very slow speed point there. He'll be kicking himself that he let Will by because this has really cost him. Very evenly matched through turn one on those images. Sorry, JT, could you please confirm the car number? Sounds like there's someone going to get a penalty for something. 76 to be served at its next pit stop. Five second penalty for Gary Jacobson, so James Taylor just confirming that with Paul Martin and uh, exceeding track limits. So he's the first one to actually get a slap. There's the confirmation graphic for you on screen as Anton now comes in for his uh, second stop. So, the, oh, look at the fizz. Oh. So they, I can't believe that he's actually kept on trucking at the pace he yeah, has. He said to Ludo, I can't see where I'm going. Tell me if it's raining. It's extraordinary. So that tear off, you'll, you'll see the DJR okay, personnel grab the Dayglow tear off there on the left and the right, and they'll rip this thing off. Check this out. It'll get done after the wheels. It's amazing how they don't think about the visibility too much. Yeah. Have a look at that. Let like... there be light. Yeah, mate. So I'm done waiting on fuel. Yeah, here. A little brake ducting. Or maybe they've done a clean like... rather than anything Three, in terms of change. So a clear out of the yeah, radiator yeah, yeah, duct. And off he goes. Pretty straightforward. Cam Waters in the foreground goes through. Van Gisbergen's got the lead over Percat, 19 second margin. Gary Jacobs has got a five second penalty for exceeding those track limits. This is Jack LeBrock. Yeah, okay to go on the drop. Okay to go on the drop. Get squally down clear, the inside here clear. at turn two. Still clear. Still clear. Still clear. Go, 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 go. Now, when does Van Gisbergen's fuel window closes on lap 68 on our numbers? Where are we at? We're on 53 now. That's going to be dependent. That, that's when it's out of fuel, but the decision will be taken potentially before that, depending on the tyre behaviour. Here we are riding on board with car number 97 now, making the run into turn one. See just how briefly they're in top gear here with these cars. They're not sitting in it for terribly long. That rattle that went through the car there is the Vallelunga curving on the outside of turn one. Kisses that apex. I do want to get another 10, if you can, please. He looks pretty relaxed at the helm there at the moment as Nick Perkat comes in from fourth position. He takes Tim Slade in with him. And the communication with Andrew Edwards was really good then, wasn't it? It was really calm. Could, can you get me another 10, please? It was all really respectful. Mind yourself up with me and hit the board. Coming up to racing for almost an hour and a half okay, now. It's a hot introduction to a brand new season. We've got a car coming down the lane now. We've got a car on the lane, so just be ready for it. Be ready for it for the drop. Get to the point. 
Great. Yeah, yeah, mate. Get across. Get across quickly. Per cap. Dropping in front of Tim Slade. Car number 34 has also copped a penalty in the process out there. Jack and Brock's got five seconds on his computer timing here. So this Nobody is... Nobody is to touch the car when it drops. Yeah. Gary Jacobson... Okay, cars are just, just waiting on you. When you drop, we will hold for five seconds. Do not go anywhere. So a hold here for Gary. That was the penalty for exceeding track limits. Held to five and gone. Van Gisbergen, Brody Kostecki, Feeney, Brown, Courtney Waters, Dick Squally, Davison, Hein Gartner, Mostert. That's the current temper on board now. How good is that visibility now? Yeah. now? More like a birthday. It would be huge. It would be quite refreshing. That would be mentally taxing what he was dealing with before. I heard Scott Pye in the background also. Just He's going to box that car once again because he's still got some troubles out there. They did patch that car up and get him out. So, lap speed wise, Kostecki's last lap was a 34 8, 35 2 for Brock Feeney, 4 1 for Will Brown, 4 2 for James Courtney. I missed Shane Van Gisbergen's time, but it was a very quick time 33 2 there for Anton Di Pasquale, and he was the fastest on the last lap. We just keep a bit of an eye on that. He's 45 odd seconds from the lead at the moment in the little seesaw that's going on. Here we go. We're riding with him. Oh, that was a gap that completely diminished when he got down towards the apex there at turn four. He's having another sniff again down the inside of Cam Waters, and this time he gets through at five. So you can tell there Ludo is starting to get his game face on. 23 laps remaining. Van Gisbergen leads. Di Pasquale, fastest car on the track, absolutely coming forward. This is going to be intriguing. Event number one, Repco Supercars Championship, the Borough Pairs Sydney Super Night. We've got 22 laps remaining. Scott Pye is the car that ducked off to the left-hand side of your screen there. They've got power steering troubles with that car, and he's going to bring it back into the pit lane. He was out of the game early on. But his electrical entry is Bryce Fullwood, who's moved across to Brad Jones Racing. He's sitting in 12th position at the moment. David Reynolds on screen. They had that car parked in the garage at one stage there as well for Grove Racing. So there are a couple of people in the walking wounded department out there at present. Now, Deepa Squally, he's fueled to the end mark. And uh, so is Will Brown. Brody Kostecki's currently sitting in second position. Shane Van Gisbergen's got to make another stop. Five second time penalty, car number 96 now exceeding track limits. And so that's Macaulay Jones in the automotive superstore entry. So there are a few people that have used up all their credit. And now Motorsport Australia Race Control is uh, making sure that they pay a penalty. Feeney, and where's uh, Brock at the moment? Sitting in third position. So Van Gisbergen over Deep Pasquale, 44 seconds. 37 odd seconds to get through the pit lane. Yeah, and how much is, more has he got to put on? Uh, I need to, sorry, I'll come back to you on that. Let me just add it up. So he's taken total fuel of 99. So he's got, uh, he's got 58 to put in, hasn't he? 41, right, if I've got that right. He's got roughly 40 litres right. to stick in. Yeah. So this is uh, a sad sight, unfortunately, for Scott Pye. That's the owner of the car there, Charlie Schwerkolt. Sorry, folks, we're just trying to do numbers here to understand who's doing what. So yeah, Shane took on a 58 mark in that last stop. These are our numbers. They're not 100%. And... Uh, uh, 41 in the first stop, so he's taken on 99. The requirement in the race is you've got to take on 140 litres, so uh, he's got, got 40 odd litres to put into that car. Divide uh, that by 3.75, then you get an idea of how long he'll be standing still. So 10 seconds stop 10, roughly. 10.6 seconds of fuel to take on board. And 
Hawks. He's trying to make hay with those tyres out there at the moment. So it's still an intriguing battle. Shane Van Gisbergen over Brody Kostecki, Brock Feeney. Big night for him with 20 laps now remaining. So they've been racing now for an hour and 31 minutes. We've got 20 laps remaining. It's a replay here of Shane Van Gisbergen. Event one, Repco Supercars Championship. Oh, the oh, yeah. Sydney Super Night. Was that friendly? Jack LeBron. Right. That was a, not a nice Was it a friendly sign? No. It was New Zealand for, I don't think you treated me nicely. We're currently not friends. Yeah, that one. Uh, his first sector split, Shane Van Gisbergen, on the last lap was personal best again. He's been very, he's been getting quicker and quicker in the first sector. He's making a bit of ground there at the moment. As we look at Cam Waters, who's about to peel into the lane, and we've got Will Davison on the run down into turn one. Mark Larkin. Pompe, you reckon you're struggling, mate? I'm trying to walk the pit lane and read this race. So the best way to do it is pitches, right? Shane Van Gisbergen out in front. Now, doesn't matter who we select up the front there, you can see he's charging away from them. When we get rid of those guys, Anton Di Pasquale, look at that, just turned at him. But where it gets interesting, current field situation, right? Shane's nearly out. Then you look here, William Brown, Anton Di Pasquale. You can see a whole bunch of these, look at them, all the same fuel to get him to the other end. Why is that important? Weather. Yeah. It's coming. We're right here. <laughs> it's a coming. So you might get fuel to put it on. Wet tyres, maybe three laps to go. Who knows? Fascinating. Love it. It's a nail biter, isn't it? And the problem is when you bet against that, it's so hard. And that's what we talked about at the setup at the very beginning of the race. Here's Shane. Cool shot in the run into turn one. 35 seconds near enough is the margin over his own teammate, Brock Feeney, who's held his held up very high so far this evening. So. We heard a few laps ago Andrew Edwards say to Shane that you're in a 10 lap window now before you stop and that was short of the window closing for the fuel in that car which is showing on our computer as 68 laps into the race. 77 lap race tonight. Fastest lap of the race has been achieved by Andre Heimgartner. Win, lose or draw he's made a good start Mark so he slipped in there and clearly showing good competitive signs. Absolutely. When you watch Van Gisbergen drive that car, he was not sliding it. He was driving it, we call on positive lock, so he, he, he wasn't ever getting to a point where he is sliding it and you see him gather it back up. He was driving it on the front wheel, flowing it beautifully. That was Will Brown putting a move on Brock Feeney, so that takes Will Brown at the second. He's still in contention, Will Brown. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So don't, don't think that he's going to go away. He's going to be hard to beat because Van Gisbergen's got that extra stop to make. So Will Brown's in this thing, whether he can make the tyre live and what his pace is like towards the end is still a question mark with 19 laps remaining. But he's absolutely in the hunt for Boost Mobile Racing. The second part of this story really is how fast is Di Pasquale and what is the time loss? What does Van Gisbergen do? How does it correlate with Di Pasquale when he does come in at that point? Yeah, so last lap, Will Brown was the 11th quickest car out there. And uh, Tom Moore and Barry Ryan will be looking at some of the same data here at the moment. So the margin between Anton and Will is, what, seven odd seconds? Yeah. And... In terms of pace, Di Pasquale was fourth fastest. James Courtney's done a really good job, yeah, actually. Yeah, he's got another stop to come. He has. And uh, so does Brock. So, really, Feeney and, and Courtney are out just, of situ. just academic in the argument at the moment. So we yeah. need to keep an eye on, on what Shane's next stop is going to look like and how efficiently they process that. They've been very good at that Triple Eight race engineering. The question mark for me around Will is just what those tyres are behaving like at the moment, Mark. And will they, will they survive? Because he, he's not showing pace at the moment. He was 14th fastest on the last lap. And I'll just keep a real close eye on where Anton sits pace-wise relative to both Shane and Will. And riding here with Van Gisbergen. So this, on approach, 270 kilometers an hour, 75 minutes a second. You watch his hands. So back to fifth and have a look at his hands. It's all positive.
positive lock. There's no slide. He's, he's, he does a remarkable job of this because we know his car control is great, but you don't see him slide. Down on a newer tire and then referencing it when it rains. So he's just giving us an update on how much more life's left in the tyre. Remember, he's trying to stretch the most he can out of the Super Soft and he's trying to eggshell it. And then Andrew's saying, which kind of tallies with our numbers, that you're out of fuel in the not too distant future, but you've got to get three or four more laps out of the tyre. Now, James Courtney's just come in, like we predicted. That moves Anton up into fourth position. Brock Feeney's got to come in as well. So there's James in the opposite lock entry. So Will Brown still right in this. Will Brown is absolutely in it, which is a great story and a big one from last year. So the other part of this is this is where the discrepancy between driver feedback and ultimately the, the fuel number not really correlating. Here's an important grass, message, grass, Mark. Grass, grass, Bad sportsmanship grass, flag for Will Brown grass, for exceeding grass, track grass, limits. Get way, so he can't go, get go, go, any go, go, go. wilder when it comes to stepping over the line or he'll get a five second penalty. He cannot afford that right now. I saw him on the way out of turn five on the previous lap, definitely over the yellow line, both, both wheels. So as soon as you exceed that, you put four wheels outside the yellow line and that's when you get pinged. So for sure, they've been racking up in terms of numbers for Will, and that is a bad sportsmanship plaque. That'll contain his pace in a couple of those key areas. So here's Anton Di Pasquale around the outside of Brock Feeney. Feeney, remember, has got to come back in. So he's not really in the contest at this point, Guff. Down here with Barry Ryan, team principal for Boost Mobile, Erebus Racing. Will Brown, not far away from taking over the lead. Shane Van Gisbergen coming to the lane. Can you hold Shane off when, at the end of the race when he's coming back at you on a fresh tyre? Of course we can. Why wouldn't we? <laughs> um, yeah, let's hope. Um, Will's doing a really good job of managing the tyres, so, you know, 15, 16 to go, and Shane's got a pit, so Anton's catching us a little bit, so, yeah, it's going to be a good scrap. Good luck. Hey? Good luck. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Cheers. He's yeah. a hardcore racer, Barry Ryan. Yeah, he is. Absolutely. Yeah. Way back from Larry Perkins' oh. days. Oh, that was oh. just an awkward moment there for McCauley when they uh, just trapped the tear off in behind the wiper. Now he's away. I think that actually oh. stalled there. I thought one of the guys fell over. I, no, I wasn't no. looking at that. No. Yeah, so Barry's onto it. So last lap we've got oh, Anton gaining 0.3 of a second on Will. He's 5.3 seconds behind. Be got Shane Van Gisbergen. Go, go, go. Brock Feeney does his stop. Got Shane Van Gisbergen in rounded terms, 40 seconds up the road, but it's a 37 second transit into the pit lane, plus 10 seconds of fuel for him. That's going to take him out of the battle for the lead, but he'll have fresh tyres. And Will's not convincing me at the moment with pace. <laughs> so, I mean, he might be nursing them like Barry says, but he's. He's 13th quickest in the last lap. Does he got to well, send you a memo, does he? Say, <laughs> oh, please, please feel yeah, like it's, it's, it's positive. I want to be glass half full. Oh, oh down down the inside, inside. Comes the waters, And uh, that gap diminished very quickly. He thought about it. But Brock's got fresh rubber on that. He's going to give it a hit. He's going to give it a hit. Straight down the inside. He's got the super soft tyre on Cam Waters, but he was able to fire straight down there, and then Brock's done the crisscross and flicked back on the left-hand side. So if we go on the numbers that Andrew Edwards and Shane were talking about, and I just heard in the background that he may well be stopping imminently. So just focus on the numbers there, MS. So it's a 40-second margin for Shane. The margin between Brown and Di Pasquale is down to 4.2 seconds. He's taken another second out of him. Yep. And the last lap, Will Brown was the 14th quickest car out there. Di Pasquale was the sixth quickest. Yes, I was about to say the same thing. So that good pace. So how what? does this happen? So hey. Andre and Thomas having a little bumping duel. Is he trying to come over? I don't know what that was. It must have been a bit of history I, to this. Yeah, you'll... you'll Need to go back in time to understand what that was all about. You're going to be careful doing that because uh, Heimgarten is in a reasonably competitive position. Right, here's a key stop. So listen to this communication. Three more. Two more. Swing 
across now, mate. Centre on the board. Hold the big pressure as we go up. That's Anton going by. So that's the snapshot. Will Brown's our leader. Shane Van Gisbergen takes his final stop. Anton Di Pasquale moves into second spot. 3.4 seconds behind Will Brown, who last lap was 15th quickest. So you've got a situation here where you've got the reigning champion with fresh tyres and 14 laps to go. He's eight point, well, correcting that, he's 9.1 seconds from the lead and he's 5.7 seconds behind Anton Di Pasquale. So he can go berserk now. It'll yep. be qualifying laps from Van Gisbergen. We relish that prospect. And they're all hunting this young guy who had a victory here at Sydney Motorsport Park last year. But he's trying to nurse some tyres home. He's got 14 odd laps multiplied by near enough to 4 k's a lap. There's still a fair journey in this. And he's got the bad sportsmanship flag. He can't use too much road on the exit of 8 or 5. So he's going to be conservative on the exits. Di Pasquale's got pace, so he's making ground on Will Brown. But the guy that is coming at them is Shane Van Gisbergen. That 8 second gap to Will Brown is the thing that we're going to be giving you every bit of detail on because 14 laps remain, eight second gap, and I don't want to be that one. I do not want to be Jack Smith because he's about to be attacked by Van Gisbergen. So he'll have missile lock on Shane Van Gisbergen. He's 7.9 seconds behind the lead. Two seconds is the gap now between Di Pasquale and Brown. Last lap, Will was 18th quickest in the queue. Anton was 10th quickest. And Shane, once he gets these tyres temped and pressured up, He's going to be very quick. He'll be amongst the quickest cars out there. Intriguing battle. Three different teams. Three different yep. drivers. 5.7. In different phases of their career. <laughs> and I keep forgetting about it, but I shouldn't, because that is a huge story. It was Andrew Edwards in the background that you can hear. And will that weather get here and change the story? Because we've still got 50-odd kilometres of racing to come. 13 laps. It's a long way around here. So Andrew Edwards just said it's 5.7 seconds to Deepa Squally. And he comes straight back. Shane went straight back and went, it's all good. Leave me alone, I'll be all right. Yeah, yeah. which is code for but thank you. But let me get on up. it. Yeah. <laughs> So 1.4 seconds is now the gap. That's the margin first to second on your screen. So Di Pasquale, as we suspected, has got pace. But there's the lurker in the background. So you've got Van Gisbergen out of the hairpin. And he's got eyes on both. Respective garages at Erebus and Dick Johnson Racing. And Jack Smith is the meat and the sandwich here in car number four. And he was the one that tangled with Heimgartner a few laps ago. He steps out of the way. Well done, Jack. He makes space for Van Gisberg and gives him clear passage to get on with the lead battle. Really good job. All right, it's officially under one second now, the margin between Brown and Di Pasquale. Now, Anton will be well aware of who's in the background. So he's got to push without going too crazy. Now, Will Brown on the last lap, 20th quick. So that car is battling on these tyres now, Mark. Yeah, for sure. Who do you reckon was fastest? SVG, oh, yeah. <laughs> so straight away, Van Gisbergen does his fastest lap of the race with a 32.5. And that gap now, as you can see, is just under one second with Deep Pasquale. So Anton's going to be clever here too. He's got to go straight up to Brown and not mess about. The only way for him to get away with this now is to put a good, strong, well-executed manoeuvre and set up the pass, construct the spot that you're going to do this at. Six laps in favour of tyre life here for Anton Di Pasquale as he ranges up onto the back of Will Brown, who's really got a battle on his hands here at the moment. He's just running out of grip, unfortunately, and he is going to be passed by Anton Di Pasquale, who has to hustle because three seconds behind at the moment is Shane Van Gisbergen on a fresh set of tyres, and he'll take no prisoners in the process. So Di Pasquale sits it up higher. Now he'll turn down shallow and try and get better drive out of the corner. He should have better drive and be able to execute this by the time he gets to the bottom of the straight. He's in the draft, thinks about it. Not an easy place to do it, but he might get it done down at turn two. 
stuck in behind him. 0.17 officially is the margin between them. Is he got enough in reserve to get down the inside here into turn two? Van Gisbergen in the background now, just 2.3 seconds behind. And all of this good for Shane. Is absolutely good for Shane Van Gisbergen because it's going to draw him into the battle because these two will slow each other up in the process. So can Van Gisbergen at the moment rely on Deep Pasquale firing down the inside and maybe pushing Will Brown wide and capitalise. He does the first part. Deep Pasquale straight down there, gets it done. Will puts the white flag up and said, OK. But here comes Van Gisberg, and he's in such a strong position here. He is. And the math earlier in the week suggested that there was a tiny advantage in the whole three stop. But the bit that had us all fumbled was what was the super soft tyre going to do and what was the weather going to do? Well, at the moment, the super soft has been more consistent and the weather's been non-existent. And now Shane Van Gisbergen's proving the three-stop theory. So he rounds him up with ease and now he's going to do exactly the same to Anton Di Pasquale. So he's done that relatively easily in the last several laps. So he's just cruising up onto the back of him now. Anton's probably going to put up a bit of a fight here, but there's not much he can do about the extra grip that he's got. Look at this, he just gets the traction out of the corner. Done. And that's sorted. Gives him a ton of space. And that's a change for the lead. Van Gisbergen now takes command. Ten laps remaining. Jamie Wincup running operations down there at the Red Bull Ampole Racing Team. Now the question becomes, can Will Brown survive? Because Will Davison is eight odd seconds behind. And if Will Brown continues to battle on those tyres, and Davison and Mostert have got their own little battle going here in fourth and fifth, which we've just picked up. So these guys could well end up battling for the last position on the podium, Mark. That could be the case. The problem is, is that Brown, Davison, Mostert and Heimgartner, all that next group, are all crippled. Yeah. They're, they're, all, they're all wobbling. Walking wounded. Yeah. So, and the reason for that is that Brown's last stop was on 44. Uh, for Mostert, it was 48. For Davison, it was 49. Yep. So long stints. And we know that this track is torturous on tyres. So Mostert tries to do the over and under, tries to run it into the hairpin wide and turn down late and get off the inside of the hairpin to run up to this fast change of direction. His only way, really, is he can probably fire down there. Oh, he was looking to fire down there. He might have even rubbed the back of the Mustang there just to give him a little unsettling. That was very close. Nice driving, Chas Mostert. They're both sliding a lot, though, aren't they? Yep. behind uh, these guys at the moment behind Will Brown. They're about six seconds off. We'll keep an eye on that margin and see whether it changes much. So last lap for Anton, he was 15th quickest. For Will Brown, 22nd. But for Will Davison and uh, for Chaz, 14th and 12th respectively. So adding to your point there, they don't have a lot of firepower. Now Mostert has a think. He's got him. Yeah. Nice. That looked like it was going to end up in two doors grinding. Ryan Walkinshaw, who just arrived from overseas yesterday. That was a nice move by Mostert. Yeah, he's just got that one done. Moves him up into fourth position, exactly six seconds behind Will Brown. Now, our timing saying that it's just on a soft tyre. I'm pretty sure they put seconds, than you. super soft on that one, bro. Could be wrong on Mostert. Yeah. Super soft at the moment. Yeah, to the timing. Yeah, good. So that that move now, a little bit of that front grip will have helped him just break the car and modulate the inside front wheel locking to get into there. He's able to do it nicely. So on board now with the replay. So that little bump, that's just a little bit of gamesmanship on the way out of turn two. Sacrifice the exit, get a good run off three, turns back on the inside of Will, and then you're on board now for this move, this dive, and he dives down the inside. Very nicely done, Chas Mosset. Again, that's the construct of the pass. 
It's not just as simple as going, oh yeah, I think I'll fight it on the inside. It all started in the middle of turn two and was finally executed on the way into turn four. So immediately now he's been cleared. Chas Mostert is able to make a bit of ground on Will Brown, so that's already crushed down to four odd seconds. Uh, but it's a long stint on those super soft tyres uh, for Chas Mostert. And so to get them from when he last stopped, uh, which was on lap 48, to get him to the end of the race, you've got to do, what, 29 laps. So uh, he's got to tippy-toe around the problem a little bit here as well. But he is showing speed relative to Will, who's definitely just struggling to try and sneak that home at the moment. So that's really eaten its tyres in this stint. It, it smashed them. Will Brown is really in trouble for those tyres. Look at those numbers. In the 36s and 37s, plays 34s and 35s. So our top 10, Van Gisbergen over Deeper Squally. Shane's got a six second margin now. He'll be cruising. Then Brown, then Mostert, then Davison. Heimgartner. That side swipe on the front straight was weird, wasn't it? Then Kostecki, Percat, Slade, and Brock Feeney. So if young Brock can sneak into the top 10, as he starts with the Red Bull team, that'd be a nice opening account. Ryan Walkinshaw is watching Chaz Boston very carefully. 2.8 seconds is the margin now. So on current estimate, he's going to get there. He's going to get there, and that gets him onto the podium. Now, in fact, I wonder, what have we got? Seven laps remaining. Yeah, it'd be a stretch, but he might even threaten Anton at the back end as well. Depends on how long it takes to battle with Brown. To be served in its pit stop. And Kostecki's got a five-second penalty. Jake Kostecki, that is. There are two of them in the race, including Brody. And Brody, I mentioned before, is sitting in seventh position. So Chaz has got a blaze going here at the moment. And there's the margin. So you can see the gap between Will Brown and Chaz Mostert. He's sliding around a lot through turn five on the exit there. And there's still a, a little bit of time to go before we get to the chequered flag on this one for Chas Mostert so you can't afford to start greasing those tyres up too much at this stage. When you think about the length of the lap it's almost 4 k's just under 30 kilometres left on those tyres and the turning for so long at this venue you've been saying it the whole time in terms of the character of the place you're in the corner for so long and the tyre load is extreme the worst tyre degradation of anywhere we go to and you can see the aggression and it, but he is driving it nicely. I mean, he is sliding it because that's just what happens with the tyre as it deteriorates. But he's actually containing the amount of oversteer and not exciting the rear wheels with wheel spin. He's driving it as smooth as he can with a limited amount of grip. So he's... And he just said he's got a possibility of getting to P2. That was a... Yeah, <laughs> uh, they're the numbers that I'm looking at at the moment. So it, he's... Well able to clear Will Brown here, and depending on how much of a struggle Anton's got going, so he's 13th quickest on the last lap. Chaz was ninth fastest. Mind you, he's, he's not mowing caliber, eight, uh, caliber 9 down in a hurry at the moment, is he? And this is an intriguing battle as well, Mark. It's far from resolved between Heimgartner, Kostecki and Perkat. In fact, Nick, has he made that spot? Gee, it's dirty on the outside line there at turn three. Not quite. Into locking those cars on the run down to four. It looked like he might have been able to get that done, but it didn't quite work out. Yeah, it looked good on the way out of turn two into turn three, didn't it? As Betty Flamenco looks on her young charges, Will Brown and Brody Kostecki, currently third and seventh. So there's Brody, who's basically in behind Heimgartner, and again, on the previous lap, they were all very, very similar pace. Looked like Percat was going better than them, but hasn't been able to make that move. He might still. Here we go. Down the inside, Mostert. Very nice. So, Will Brown is absolutely so wounded on those tyres. Now, he couldn't contain three, where the car three, landed. Three, five to go. And on is eight seconds in front. So, probably not. Uh, so Adam, Adam was trying to sell the dream of getting to Anton. Maybe a little hard with only five laps remaining, but I'm sure Chaz will still give that a crack. But Will was, he just had no way to fight then. If you, on 
board that boost mobile Commodore at the left hander. He couldn't hold the car tight enough. And when he ran wide, the car was on the slide straight down the inside by Mostert. Nice move. And as we go on board now, the same thing, Gisberg, and they, he has driven brilliantly again. What a way to start his 2022 campaign. And the typical strategy of the Red Bull Ampol racing team and the way they've gone about this tonight with three stops has proven a real yield in terms of pace to an 11 second gap now. Yeah, he's just trolling, isn't he? And uh, he's not sliding the car at all. He's got good fresh tyres on it. He's comfortably in good shape here. Meantime, his teammate Brock Feeney has just been warned about exceeding the track limits as well. There are currently five, about to be four laps remaining for Shane Van Gisbergen with a hefty margin over Anton Di Pasquale and then Chas Mostert in third. Uh, 8.9 seconds behind now Mostert over Anton and I don't think there's going to be enough time for him to be able to get there. But Will Brown though, going to find himself under pressure from Will Davison and Brody Gostecki and uh, further afield Nick Perkat, Andre Heimgartner, Tim Slay and Feeney who I just mentioned a moment ago. So Will Davison for sure, you can see that gap there. The car in front is Will Brown. And the mid-corner pace you can see with Will Davison there was probably five or six kilometres an hour better. And have a look, even the braking grip. Often we talk about the corner grip when the tyre goes away, but the braking grip is also a big factor. Nice throttle modulation there by Will Davison. Makes the gear change off the change of direction and fires it down the hill into turn four. A lot more undulation than you think. If you're standing at the back of the pit area, it's a really cool piece of road. So a little bit telling here, Mark. I've just been stunning the numbers between Anton and Chaz, but I reckon in order to be able to make the ground that he has, Chaz has now taken the best edge out of those Dunlop super soft tyres. So yep. last lap, Anton was 10th quickest and Chaz was 12th quickest, so I think, if anything, there's only four laps to go, but things are pretty well sorted there now. It's a 9.4 second margin between Anton and Chaz. Bang. Will Davison just rattling on the back of Will Brown's car, and again, and just forcing the issue. This is an awkward spot to do it, but it looks like he's got enough pace, and he has been able to sneak on by. Thomas Randall, who's in the Castrol entry there, he's out of sequence. He's down in 21st position in the green Mustang. So I think that's pretty much resolved. That margin's beginning to open up now between Di Pasquale and Mostert. So uh, that job's done. And so for both Anton and for Chaz, it's just gently as you go now, you've got to actually get these things home because yep. they've seen the best when it comes to getting the tyre life out of the Dunlop tyre. Three laps remain. And Shane Van Gisbergen is going to add to his already impressive tally at this racetrack. And the extraordinary performance that he put together last year to pick up the championship where 27 of the 30 races that were completed, he was able to be in the top 10, and 23 of those, he was on the podium, which was a remarkable run of consistency. This is on board with Di Pasquale. I think the learning from this is you'll see a lot more of the three-stop strategy tomorrow. And I think the learning is that you're not fighting an equal battle when you look at Di Pasquale's genuine pace with Van Gisbergen all night and, and all through the course of today, been very similar. But to be beaten by 15 seconds with three laps remaining, the three-stopper has been a real yield. Yeah, for sure. And that looked like the case in theory earlier in the weekend, but as we said, we just had no idea about what was going to happen with those tyres and then most recently with the weather that still hasn't arrived. It would have been uh, hot, hard work out there tonight. Uh, 100%. And they've got to back up and do it all again tomorrow. So it'll be into the ice bath and then into recovery mode from uh, rehydration and, and uh, just getting some food on board again. Shane was saying after Friday's run that he was really noticing it, just how humid it was in the car. It was pretty brutal out there. At car number 18, Mark Winterbottom's been warned about track limits as well. That gentleman closest to camera on the right-hand side of screen is Andrew Edwards, and the younger fellow alongside is Martin Short, who's engineering Brock Feeney this evening, and Brock is sitting in 10th position. Nice way to start Andrew's account and his new race team. Come straight out and win your first event with... Yeah. 
the series champion. Not a bad way to get started, is it? And uh, be quite a significant cultural shift. You know, when you go from one team to another, you've got to learn so many new things, new people, new procedures, process. Every organisation does it very differently. And even the way they fed all the cars is dramatically different from place to place. So there's quite a learning exercise. So this time through, it'll just be one lap to go now for Van Gisbergen. And that's now 16 and a half seconds, Mark. So he's continued just to steam on out in that lead. So he's halfway down the front straight. And uh, the next nearest car is miles behind at the moment. And when you said before he was cruising, his fastest car on that lap again. Yeah. He'll end up winning this thing by about 19 seconds. Crazy, so he, he gapped the field and the three stopper. I mean, seriously, it's, a, it's something that's been discussed in the background the whole time. They were very cagey and no one anticipated them putting it to this effect. They've done it and smashed everybody. They're big time, haven't they? So uh, it was soft tyre for him at the beginning, then super soft. And then onto the soft tyre. And thank you. Reynolds and Van Gisbergen. Just had a big slide then on the way into there. Don't I think need to have a spin on the last lap. I think he's actually enjoying himself out there at the he moment. Is. Yeah, the car's obviously yeah. beautifully balanced. He's at the peak of his powers. Uh, meantime, uh, Heimgarten has just come into the pits after what should have been a solid top 10 performance for him. So. I don't know what the story is. I heard the car go by. That's moved a bunch of people up. Nick Perkett's moved up as well. So I don't know what's going on there. All right, Shane Van Gisbergen. Lines it up. Whoa! Gets the big slide going. There's a celebration going on in that cockpit. And he gasses it up out of the final corner in second gear and slides it into third. Brings it onto the line. 450 races into his career. And Shane Van Gisbergen opens his 2022 account Nailed it out of the final corner. And that is victory number 55. Home in second place is Anton Di Pasquale. 19.5 seconds behind, but an important start for him because he had to play catch up last year when he started with a new team. By the time we got to Taylor Bend, it started to turn around for him. But that puts him in the game in the championship right off the bat. And Chaz Mostert in third hour, reigning Bathurst champion. And the men and women at the Red Bull Ampole Racing Team celebrating a fine start. And we know that Roland Dane's not here this weekend, but I'm sure he's sitting at the front of the television with a big smile on his face watching his team do such a great job. Jamie Winkup, his daughter Jessica, the team in terms of structure has changed more probably this year than it has since Roland founded the team in 2003 in the elation you can see there. Andrew Edwards first run with Shane Van Gisbergen comes out as the victor. Great strategy, well executed, beautifully driven. It's as good as it gets. And he looks fairly comfortable in the car there at the moment, doesn't he? So there's our top three. The familiar names, Van Gisbergen, Di Pasquale and Mostert, one, two and three. Just off the podium, Will Davison, Brody Kostecki, a fighting drive. Will Brown struggling with those tyres at the end, home in seventh position. I'm curious to understand what happened with Heimgartner at the back end. Out there. of so, fuel, I heard. Oh, was it? Yeah. All right, so all of a sudden he's popped back into the field in 15th position. Confirmation of the results for you. Van Gisbergen home by almost 20 seconds in our opening race of the championship from Anton Di Pasquale, then Mostert, Davison, Kostecki, Perkat, Brown down in seventh after looking like he was going to get a podium. Slade, Feeney inside the top 10 in his debut with the main team. And James Courtney did a fine job in the opposite lock entry to come home in the top 10. Cam Waters recovering from his qualifying position. Bryce Fullwood, nice opening account for him in the middies entry. LeBrock, Hazelwood, Heimgartner will follow that story for you and understand what happened. Beyond him, Winterbottom, Smith, Jacobson, Jake Kostecki, Randall, Holdsworth, Jones, Pitha, then Reynolds, and unfortunately, Scott Pye. Troubles for him early in the evening. Pertec victory lane. 150 points in the bank. And once again, it's the familiar sight and sound of Shane Van Gisbergen rolling into that position down there. So he now leads the championship.
and he picks up max points and gets things started pretty much where he left off last year. I remember the tyre intervened in what looked like it was going to be one heck of a battle at Mount Panorama, but he was competitive all weekend. And his championship performance last year, obviously, we've covered off many times. Fastest lap of the race, well, that went to Heimgartner very early in the piece when they started on the super soft tyre. The Pertec victory lane tonight belonging to Shane Van Gisbergen. The Red Bull Ampol Racing Team. So, great start for them. Maximum teams points. And a nice message on the A pillar of that car. We're with you, Southeastern Queensland. And all of those that are having a difficult time in New South Wales as well. Let's get back down there now and get in amongst the celebrations with Jess. Thanks very much, Rob Hyde. It's great to be back here in Pertec Victory Lane with our defending champion, Shane Van Gisbergen, who has picked up right where he left off. Congratulations on a brilliant drive tonight. The three-stopper worked a treat almost 20 seconds down the road from the rest of the field. Yeah, that's a team win. I had no idea what was happening in the middle of the race there, but, um, yeah, awesome job by the team and pretty lucky the weather held out, so I hear, but... Um, yeah, hopefully it was a good show. Thanks, everyone, for coming out, and hopefully tomorrow it's a good one too. Yeah, it was a brilliant show. Uh, must be a huge confidence boost for you and your new engineer, Andrew Edwards. Uh, what does it mean to the team to be able to start the year this way? Oh, it's awesome. You know, we've had some big changes, as obviously all talked about, but the team feels the same. It's a great way to start, and it's a, it's, a, it's a long year ahead, though, so don't get ahead of ourselves and keep working. The car was a jet tonight. Is there yeah. more in it for tomorrow? Oh, always. It's really good um, qualifying. We're getting close. Also, but Anton's just a unreal in quality, so could get better there, but a 300k race doesn't really matter where you start. How is the body feeling after 300k's? It's been hot yep. and humid all day. How do you recover for tomorrow? Oh, it's pretty hot, but I, I just drink and stuff and um, yeah, come back tomorrow, try to do it again. Enjoy the celebrations. Congratulations. Thank you. We'll head over to our second place getter tonight, Antron Di Pasquale, for the first time in his career on the podium in the first race of the season. Congratulations on a terrific start to your campaign this year. Didn't quite have enough, though, to hold off Shane Van Gisbergen tonight. Yeah, they played, uh, they threw a different card than what, what we did and got a reward for it. So we'll have a look at that. And uh, overall, happy to be in the podium, first one of the year. Uh, a bit better than what I did last year. So, uh, yeah, it's all good. Talk us through the visibility out there. At times, it looked pretty tricky. Um, yeah, my middle sim was really bad. I was battling with a couple cars, and it rained a little bit. And then I used a wiper for some stupid reason, and uh, ruined it all. So it was a lot better than the last one, but yeah, all good. Congratulations on a great result. Yeah, cheers. Thanks. And to our third place getter, Chaz Mostert, who did a brilliant job on the super soft tyre at the end there to get up on the podium. Chazzy, congratulations. Tell us what this one means to the team. Yeah, look, it's fantastic for the team. This has kind of been our bogey track at the end of last year, so definitely uh, got a better race car this weekend. So that's it's just really positive for the team to keep improving. So qualifying, still our nemesis a little bit. We can't seem to start further up than eighth around here, but um, I'm happy for the 300k race. Car looked over its tyres pretty good, but um, still a little bit of work to find these uh, catch these front two, but oh, I'm really happy with that third place. Just give us some insight into what was coming over the radio over those last 10 laps, urging you past Will Brown. Yeah, uh, obviously got to uh, Will, both wheels, Will Davo and Will Brown, and uh, they were on the soft tyre and I was super soft. So I was really worried about cooking the super soft. We obviously know that degs a fair bit more. Uh, but used the grip advantage and placed my car um, the best I could and, and got round them. But, um, yeah, I, I think those last couple of laps, I was pretty cooked from those exchanges. So glad I had that little buffer back to Will and, um, yeah, was able to hold on. Congratulations, Shaz. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. And I just want to say uh, hi to, to Coco and everyone at Mudapilly. I hope you're enjoying your Bucks party, mate. Will, Will Brown, tough finish to that one, mate. Not only were the tyres in trouble, you were in trouble as well out there. Tell us what went on. Yeah, I just got a bit hot towards the end then. We're trying a new cool box and it doesn't have hot, uh, cold helmet air. So uh, it wasn't real fun at the end there. I was getting hunted from all sorts of angles. So uh, yeah, I might have to get it back into train, put a bit of weight on, so uh, get back into it. Tell us about your race, mate. It looked like it was strong in the mid part of the race. Did you maybe that last stint try and go a bit too long? Yeah, I think uh, the first stint we went a bit early. We thought, uh, you know, we'll try and get on the super soft a bit early. And then that last one doing 35 or six laps on a, on a soft, it just tore them off for the last 10 laps. So I was trying everything, but you're just like a drift car out there. So it was hard towards the end. Still a good result, like seventh in the championship. Uh, last year we were nowhere near here, so pretty happy with that. Recover, Mel. Good luck tomorrow. Cheers. Thank you.
Well, great way to start proceedings now for Shane Van Gisbergen. 150 points in the bank for him over Anton Di Pasquale. Chaz Mostert starts well also in third position in the championship. Will Davis and Brody Kostecki, Perkat Brown, Slade, Feeney and James Courtney. They're your top 10 after our first race. We do it all again tomorrow. Some of the drivers have got quite a bit of work to do now. And uh, they've got a long season ahead to be able to do it. But the BP ultimate performance moment this evening belongs to Shane Van Gisbergen. His storming drive at the back end, impressive. And in his 450th race, able to get the job done and closed on by with those fresh tyres. Fireworks to the right on our screen. Great scene for him and probably a bit of relief because so many things have changed in the background in that team and you never quite know what's going to happen when a new engineer joins. So great way for him to get started. 150 points in the bank. It's time now for the podium to celebrate. It's time for the podium for race one of the Repco Supercars Championship at the Bow Repairs Sydney Super Night. Ladies and gentlemen, please congratulate in third place for Mobile One Optus Racing, Chaz Mostert. In second place for Shell V Power Racing Team, Anton Di Pasquale. Representing our winning team, Red Bull and Pole Racing, Tony Quinn. And in first place, please congratulate our winner for Red Bull and Pole Racing, Shane Van Gisbergen. Making the presentation of the third place trophy is Emily May from our sponsor, Bow Repairs. <laughs> Presenting our second place trophy from Seiko Australia, Yuki Suganuma. <laughs> Presenting the team's trophy from Bow Repairs, once again, Emily May. And presenting our first place trophy to the winner from Bow Repairs, Troy Manning. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your race one Bow Repairs Sydney Super Night podium. Time for the celebrations. Great scene at City Motorsport Park for Shane Van Gisbergen fans. Maximum points for him tonight in the celebration to get our championship started. Event number one, the Ripco Supercars Championship and a fighting battle at the end. Home by 19 and a half seconds over Anton Di Pasquale. Great strategy from Red Bull. Three-stop strategy made them quicker to the end of the race using their tyre as well. So much enjoyment in being able to celebrate some motor racing out here and so good to have our fans back at the race and we were thankful that we didn't get smashed with the heavy weather that was being talked about on the Blue Mountains. Boost Mobile highlights now. Let's have a look at race number one in reflection and it was a ripping start by both the boys on the front row of the grid in bright daylight at this point. The lights had switched on. Jumping on board here with Di Pasquale, who had the inside line and the run to turn one, and that worked out pretty nicely for him. There are only a few people, about three or four, who took on the super soft tyre at the very start. One of them was Andre Heimgartner in the RJ Batteries entry, car number eight. Slowly but surely, he peeled his way through the field with that grip advantage and was able to take the lead. First round of stops, and effectively cars 11 and 8 switched strategies. So for Di Pasquale, went on to the super soft tyre. There are a couple of nail-biting moments in this one. This one at turn five, and uh, Mark Winterbottom just getting tangled up in an interesting move down the inside here, and was able to put that together very nicely. Fed at second gear to be able to do the job and popped out the other side. Meantime, Shane Van Gisbergen, three-stop strategy for him. They put their super soft tyre with the blue markings on it on later in the game, and it worked out very well. 
fact, their strategy is something that everybody will look at long and hard for tomorrow. And then it was an impressive blaze at the back end of it. We saw Will Brown battling with tyres, and he was hot in the cockpit of that car. Anton Di Pasquale had seen the best out of his tyres. He had nothing in reserve, and Shane Van Gisbergen was able to disappear down the road and put margin on at the end. In fact, he drove pretty hard to the end. He wasn't sliding the car, but it had tremendous pace. 450 races into his career. He picks up race win number 55 and his eighth race victory here at Sydney Motorsport Park. That car was behaving beautifully. He drove it to perfection and the strategy and the partnership with his new engineer, Andrew Edwards, worked out ideally. So he walks away with the gold this evening. 150 points in the bank and we do it all again.